Hello, friends. Welcome. I'm seeing the, the chat is starting up. It's lovely to have you here. And uh, I'm just going to wait for some people to come in, see what's going on. I can see a few of you. Exotic Terrain, hello. Elverta, hello to you. Scarlet O'Haha, hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time. In fact, everybody who is watching on the live stream, thank you for taking the time to join us. It is half past eight in the evening, my time. I don't know what time it is for you. I hope you've had a pleasant Monday so far. If you're watching this on the playback, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And I hope that you are going to enjoy watching the chat as it comes up, because we do have some incredibly funny, insightful and useful comments every week that we do these live streams. So I know that there's going to be lots of things to add value. As per usual, we do have some updates, some repatriation slash decolonization news. We have some new news. We do have some ding-dongs, which we may have to rename because for the past few weeks, they have not been phallic in nature, but they've definitely been about people being ding-dongs. And that is the same <laughs> this week too. We do also have some uh, inf events and exhibition information. The Opera Pinboard had some issues with being able to be uploaded. I'm going to try again after this goes out. So in the description box, you will see Opera Pinboard coming soon. I hope that's the case. If not, there is always the fail safe of all of the news items we'll be looking at being linked in the description box too, in order. You will notice that they are numbered in the description box and that number will correspond to a slide that you will see placed on the bottom of the screen in the slideshow that we're about to look at. I'm not quite sure what happened with the Opera pin board. It has happened before. It's a little bit frustrating and I don't know how to fix it. So we will move on as we can. I've also seen that YouTube is planning to do something with links in the description box that they're not going to be clickable or that they can't be there. So we may have to reroute this whole thing uh, and see where we where we get going. But it might just be to do with short content. I need to go and read what they're talking about because I'm not 100% sure what they were saying. So I need to double double check what's going on there. Uh, I did see somebody suggest that we call it the corner of shame. Pretty pick. We could start calling it that. We could do a ding dong news and we could also do a, uh, uh, a corner of shame. But Hadrian, uh, as you rightly say, it is also a multi-purpose segment because these people are being ding dongs. <laughs> so, so I feel like it still works. Um, and... Hello from the East Midlands of England, one of the places Dr. Cat thinks there's dragons. You are not wrong. Uh, I've been to Birmingham, more canals than Venice. That was fine. That was a city. Getting there, dragons, definitely dragons. <laughs> there's, a, there's a keyhole of England that goes M25, Brighton, everything else. It's confusing. There are sheep just, just roaming <laughs> free, it seems, and they want to bite you. Um, ding dong and ding dongs. Ding dongs and ding dongs. Yes, double double ding dongs, double Ds. That's different, isn't it? <laughs> Not that kind of a show. Not that kind of a show. Um, the ding dong awards. I mean, th there's maybe we could do that at Christmas as a sort of special episode. We could think back on all of the foul behaviour that has made the history news for the wrong reasons. Uh, and we could do it like the Didn't Happen of the Year Awards or the Darwin Awards. We could do Ding Dong of the Year. Let's figure out a way to do that. So keep, as we're doing these, keep in mind the biggest Ding Dongs. And I mean, frankly, maybe I should, if even if it's not been in a Ding Dong segment, because Florida and the governor in Florida, whose name? We're going to talk about him in a minute. His name has just momentarily escaped my mind. Um, we'll get there. Uh, that that he could well be our ding dong of twenty twenty three. So, you know, let's let's do this. I like it. I'm going to figure out how we can do a a New Year's coming into twenty twenty four live stream. The ding dong awards. It'll be much quicker than we usually are here. <laughs> Although that being said, we aren't going to, we're not going to go to three hours today. We are going to, oh, that's a good point. Yes. 
ding dong of the year, we could have a, you know, top top three ding dongs, the people who really outdid themselves and their ding dongery. And then we could do the MVP of the year. I like that pretty pick. I like that a lot. I do mean Ron DeSantis. Thank you very much. It just the name completely <laughs> fell out of my head. Uh, Liz, I do also like Fools and Fallacies. It reminds me of a very popular British TV show called Only Fools and Horses. Only Fools and Fallacies. There's there's merch in that. <laughs> there's merch in that somewhere. So let us, without further ado, um, start as we mean to go on. I have received so many news articles the, over the last two weeks and I am, as always, incredibly grateful to everybody who took the time. So we're going to start, as we always do, with the thanks for that before we jump in to our updates. So I would like to so let's take fools and fallacies off of the list because you are none of you are fools and fallacies, that is for sure. And how can I remove my... Nope, that's not going to work. Uh, how do I hide myself? There we are. That'll do it. Thank you to Scarlett O'Hara, to Joseph, Yvonne, Jessie, Mary, name twin cat, Amy, Beth, Melissa, Perpetual Mourner, Carve Felum, Alberta, Jen, Mrs. Pretty's Maid, Mr. Dr. Cat, so that's my husband, just for those who don't know, Pandora Snugpuckle, Kate, Anne, Alicia, Becky and Shane. Thank you all so much for taking the time to send me those articles. Um, the entire Little Women is here. Lovely. I'd like to see all of you in bonnets for our next session. <laughs> Everybody in a bonnet, thank you very much. Yes, I did hide on purpose because my face was over uh, Perpetual Mourner and Carve Felim's name. So let's, let's start with Florida in our first update. Well, friends, this is, um, I just, so Florida is planning to only use excerpts from Shakespeare to avoid, avoid raunchiness. Teachers in Florida, in, in, a, in a Florida county are preparing to only use excerpts rather than whole plays as a part to attempt to conform to the hard line right wing, that's a direct quote from this news article, legislation on teaching about sex. There's some raunchiness in Shakespeare, Joseph Cole, a reading teacher at Gaither High School in Hillsborough County, told the Tampa Bay Times, because that's what sold tickets in his time. The newspaper said, in staying with excerpts, the schools can teach about Shakespeare while avoiding anything racy or sexual. Now, look, I'm not going to say there's nothing sexual in Shakespeare, because of course there is, but oh, can I introduce them to the Bible? Because there's also a lot of stuff about various kinds of shagging in the Bible. The Song of Solomon is very sexy. So, right, um, this is, the, the legislation here is the Parental Rights in Education Act, which is commonly known as the Don't Say Gay Law. So it's essentially, it's what was our Section 28 from the sounds of it, except for it's been allowed to run roughshod evidently this was signed in march 22 by ron DeSantis. that that man he is a obviously he's very well paid he's very well paid oh my husband just sent me a text saying he sent me a text saying ron DeSantis and the ding dong merrily on high awards which i <laughs> i also i also enjoy um this this act also says that material that is sexual in nature should not be used in classes concerning sexual health or reproduction. 
So it's abs is it absence only? Is that what we're talking about here? Is that what that means? Because that works so famously well. Absence only sex education. That's places where that's the case. There's definitely no unwanted pregnancy at all. That that never is is a correlating factor. Cool. Um, as uh, they are completely correct that in in there was a period where lots of Shakespeare's texts were edited. Uh, for example, famously in the Victorian period, the sonnets were altered. The so-called lovely boy sonnets were altered to for the pronoun to not be a male pronoun for it to sound like it was female. That's been changed. The first folio, rightly, is a text full of innuendo and um, rudeness. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, I I am I am mostly fine. <laughs> we are monitoring my blood pressure as as we as we go. Uh, I'm just going to keep a keep a cuff on my arm <laughs> constantly. That should be the next thing. How high can cat's blood pressure go? Very, very. <laughs> Thank you so much as well for the super chats. Very kind of you. Um, this is also mum's. For Liberty are offering reading lists uh, that are basically include more likely to include far right authors than the works of Shakespeare. I I have said that I question the fact that in in my country Shakespeare is the canon subject. The and I'm using that term specifically. It's the one subject, the one topic that students in this country have to cover. It's a government order. And I, I and I have I have big questions about the the justification behind that. That if we're going to mandate that something is so integral to education, to Englishness, Britishness, I'm not quite sure if the uh, mandate stretches out to England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So I'm going to say Englishness because I know it's certainly the case in, in our education system. I I do I do wonder if that should be the case and we should, if we're going to legislate things, why not uh, abolition? Why not various forms of, of scientific education? I, I don't know why it's just Shakespeare. However, to erase it from the curriculum entirely because it's a bit sexy, what's the goal? Well, I know what the goal is. The goal is, the goal is ultimately um, that you want more, you want a domestic supply of infants. That's that's what that's what this this is what this is funding. This is what the reduction in uh, sex education. This is what the drive towards ever more stringent control over birth control and access to abortion and all of the rest of it. The the aim is simply for more babies to be born. Preferably, I think, white babies to be born. But they're they're not really that bothered because what they can also do if you have for profit adoption and for profit prisons, it's very simple to to then make a lot of money out of getting people pregnant and keeping them pregnant. So there is that, um, because this is just ridiculous. The notion that teaching Shakespeare is in some way dangerous to young people is just ridiculous. Repression and inexhaustible, inexhaustible supply of uneducated citizens is the goal. I, I, I wholly, I wholly agree. Um, I don't think they have. I think it's more nefarious than that. I think the intention is that that is as as the prison industrial complex needs bodies to enslave. That's what that's for. That's what that's for. So, yes, let's keep our eye on. Uh, I think this is being challenged. Um, we'll see. We'll see where we go. I I, I don't see good things. <laughs> However, uh, just to. Um, I'm going to try and lighten the tone, lighten the mood. Uh, and we're going to talk some good news, a good news update. The British Museum has agreed to pay our translator friend who the, her work was used without permission. This is a settlement which was signed by the translator, Wang, and the museum last Friday is going to reinstate the poetry 
of the translations, this time with proper credit and compensation. This was reported to CNN. Um, Wang said that this was an important step in recognising the often invisible complex work of translators. This is a quote from her. I'm tired, but I'm relieved. I was able to get everything I wanted. I'm pretty happy about that. But I have some frus frustration around how long that was. I wish I didn't have to go through all that in order to have things addressed. And let's also be clear that if she didn't hadn't already curated and managed to achieve the platform that she did because of the exceptional voice that she has, I don't know if we'd be in the same position. So she had to work really hard to put herself on in a position where her platform was sufficiently loud that it could not be ignored. So, um, there was also a fundraiser and uh, that that helped her. And so it just, the groundswell of information, I think the British Museum was left with few options, but to capitulate good, frankly. The, under the terms of the agreement, the museum is going to reinstate the translations with credit and payment by the end of the week. There's also going to be a spotlight page on the museum website featuring a Kuijin poem, a Kuijin poem, and it's going to make an additional donation matching their, their license fee payment to support translators of Chinese poetry. This is, yeah, this is, this is the thing, the social media noise looks so bad and let's be honest with what the British Museum's up to with the Parthenon marbles, the Benin, bonds, Benin bronzes etc they <laughs> cannot afford further bad press um, the museum also agreed to create a clearance process for translation by year's end which it did not previously have uh, we are told that this is a positive step in terms of hopefully encouraging all other museums and similar institutions to make they have make sure they have a clear policy in place, making sure translations translators are paid and properly credited for, for what they work. The British Museum apologised again, saying that what they'd done was an oversight. Quote, the museum currently does not have a policy specifically addressing the clearance of translators and, as part of its review, will ensure that translators are specifically addressed in its clearances policies and that translators are appropriately questioned in the future. Here's the thing. You use a photograph taken by the British Museum of their collection item. You use that photograph without proper credit and payment. See what happens. So they understand clearance, don't they? Because because they're making a lot of money off of it. There we go. Um, Wang said that part of British Museum takes copyright permission seriously. Yes, you do, when you're the one earning money from it, and recognise the importance of the role of translators and the value of their work, which in many cases helps to further the museum's research and widen public access to today. Not in many cases, in almost every case. If it requires translation, the work of translators is vital in every instance. Um, Wang said to the translator that the victory that was part of its significance was that it's going to enable more people to learn about this poet we are told quote she was a queer feminist poet whose work has been overlooked in translation she started translating her because she felt like her work was very timely she wanted to be read by a wider audience and to be treated with the respect that it deserves so i'm very pleased that this has played out this way i think it's it's def it's obviously the right call um it is a shame that it took too long an Australian museum, this we have the update on this. This uh has there is this is the repatriation of Cambodian stolen artifacts. This is the National Gallery of Australia is going to return three 9th and 10th century bronze sculptures to Cambodia after they were found to be stolen. We talked about the investigation that was going on. It turns out they they have been recognized to have been stolen. And um It follows a decade-long investigation carried out by the two countries to determine the origin of the works. Cambodia's government has welcomed the move as an important step towards rectifying past injustices. And there is, of course, as we know, a global push to return looted goods. 
the gallery in Australia purchased the sculptures in 2011 for 2.3 million Australian dollars from the artifacts smuggler Douglas Latchford, who died in 2020. We've heard of Douglas Latchford. His name has come up a lot. Um, so according to the ABC, the three statues were dug up in a field in the east of Cambodia and then they were smuggled across the border into Thailand and then they ended up in the Latchford collection. Mr Latchford's daughter worked alongside researchers to help return the goods. They are going to remain on display in the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra for three years while Cambodia prepares a new home for them. Quote, it's an opportunity to put right a historical wrong, but also strengthen our ties and to deepen our understanding. That's Australia's special envoy. Cambodia has continued to call on international governments to recover thousands of antiquities, it says, were stolen from ancient temples, including several, it says, are housed in the Victorian Albert and British Museum. So those, yes, we've also talked about the Cambodian delegation going to the v and the British Museum to check out what's going on there and they seem to think that there is some shenanigans afoot see this is this is the common thing that said that that and and I and I understand the joke and it's very funny but the thing that actually makes it offensive is that that's not even true if they there is so much stuff in basements and storehouses and attics, all in British Museum holdings, that they could fill that space. I don't know how many times over and over again. They could hand back the things that have been looted, that are being requested quite easily. And we could see the stuff that we don't get to see normally because it's in the basement, out of our view and out of our eyes. And it's part of our heritage that is never put on display. So I, I do know this is a joke. I do know it's a joke. And it's a funny joke. But also the truth makes it kind of even more annoying because it wouldn't be empty. And that's just, it's just greed. It's just unspeakable greed. The, this is an interesting article. So we have talked about the fines that have been made at Pompeii. The This is in the Villa San Marco, which is a high-status Rom, Roman villa on the outskirts of Stabia, and it's revealing new insights into the last moments before the eruption of Vesuvius. So I'm not quite sure whether that's Stabia is different from Pompeii or if Pompeii covers the wider area and it's part of Pompeii. My geography is shocking. This villa dates back to the Augustan age and then during the later Claudian period there were expansions. The, as a result of these additions the layout of the villa underwent significant changes. The main entrance now buried used to open onto a porticoed courtyard that provided access to the tablinum. From there you could proceed to a tetra style atrium uh, leading to four small cubicula. There are thermal baths from the atrium, um, but their alignment, we're told, deviated from the villa's main axis due to their connection with a pre-existing street running to the front of the structure. So since March 2023, archaeologists have excavated the upper, the end part of the upper portico, and they have found paintings with seated figures and large parts of the collapsed walls. The press announcement said, quote, following the story provided by the stratigraphies of lapilli and collapses and by the sequence of pyroclastic flows it is also possible to reconstruct the last hours of the villa's life. Despite the dramatic destruction the life and luxury of the villa resurface in chromatic ranges in the chromatic ranges of the paintings on the walls and ceilings in the stuccos in the capitals and in the precious croatings crowning columns and roofs added the researchers. So that is a, an interesting window into elite life, I think, before the eruption of Vesuvius. So that is a good question that I need to look up. I, be I believe this is obviously this is all part of the same excavation period. 
I'm not sure if that's in a different building though, um, because I can't remember the name of the villa in which the pizza was found. But that's an excellent question. And if anybody knows off the top of their head if this is the same place, if you remember the name of the villa, then um please do let us know in the chat. Thank you. It yes, I feel exactly the same. It's because it's 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 a it's a mausoleum and but it's also this incredible access into a way of life that that no longer exists the the survival of these wall paintings the the vibrancy of the colors is incredible um but yeah there is something incredibly sad at this just entire community wiped out and and I, even across the centuries one here's the here's what's been found and and the horror to me is palpable as well i saw this i saw the thumbnail of this uh and i was like watch that later and then i this is just reminding me to go and watch it i love his videos they're so cool but they sometimes make me hungry and they sometimes make me not want to eat for a week <laughs> depending on what comes out when he did the um that roman uh stultified fish thing i was like that that feels like it would be a lot to deal with and he's done some things with eggs i believe that made me feel i don't like eggs so that's probably why it did make me feel uncomfortable ah uh, see now scarlet i hate to burst the bubble but they don't think it's a pizza it just looks like a pizza so it's it's uh it's it had they think it had sweet toppings um, so it's not a pizza. They and and people who are aficionados of pizza are very keen to say it's not it's not a pizza. <laughs> That's the word garum. The thought of garum, and I I I think it's because it's 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 a meat based thing. Because obviously I eat pickles and I'm fine with things that have been fermented. But there's something about fermented, any kind of fermented meat that makes me feel funny, deep, deeply, un deeply un uncomfortable. Um, I think sweet toppings like pomegranate, but not no meat. So it's not like a Hawaiian. This is it's not an early Hawaiian on the wall. Although, um, do you know, what? I'm not even going to start the debate about where the pineapple belongs on a pizza because that will be a full blown, a full blown war. That will be a full blown war. fish sauce i just for me i mean i like i like worcester sauce but fish sauce is is a, is a step too far is a step too far for me i think i believe so i, I remember seeing the episode i remember seeing the episode Okay, we aren't gonna we aren't gonna get into the Hawaiian debate. I've just heard my husband shout from down the stairs, and he's just texted me saying no. Um, so <laughs> we aren't gonna get into the Hawaiian pizza debate. If you, if I'm not gonna yuck anyone's yum, if you like a Hawaiian pizza, come sit by me. We can share it. But if you don't, that's also cool. That's also cool. I think my husband might be currently filing for divorce. <laughs> it's alright. I'm not gonna make you eat it, babe. It's fine. <laughs> hear him shouting downstairs <laughs> like a like a basement goblin <laughs> um <laughs> he's just he's just hollering at me oh he'll be fine a museum in new york state is returning the remains of 19 native americans to the oneida indian nation this is a museum in rochester new york and it, they have returned the ancestral remains of 19 uh, native americans and also so funerary artefacts to the Oneida Nation on Wednesday, striving for, quote, a small step in the service of justice. The remains included those of five men, three women and two adolescent girls who lived sometime between 200 to 3000 years ago. Also a mix of pottery and other items traditionally buried with the dead were returned. The Hilary Olsen, the president of the Rochester Museum and Science State um, Science Centre, 
apologised, saying, quote, we have perpetuated harmful practices, including the excavation, collection, study and display of Native American ancestors and their belongings. This repatriation does not change the past, but we hope it is a small step in the service of justice. Events like this allow us to move past these failures with a chance for cultural institutions to take accountability and make amends. This is from Ray Halbritter, who represents the tribe, saying at the ceremony, quote, repatriation is more than the simple return of remains and cultural artefacts. So we also have here the details of other things that have been repatriated uh, and it's being connected to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act from 1990. We've got the Cornell University returning thing, returning ancestral remains in February, the Tennessee Valley Authority in March intending to repatriate the remains of nearly 5,000 Native Americans. Um, Dorothy, I'm just going to pause there. Why why are you bringing your drama <laughs> to my live chat? Why are you poking that bear? But it's cream, then jam. <laughs> Don't start a fight in my comment section. <laughs> um, 2022, Colgate University returned more than 1,500 funerary objects. Um, then in 2022, uh, an estimated 870,000 artefacts, including remains, it said it was found that they are still in the possession of colleges, museums and other institutions, according to the Associated Press. So there is still a lot of work to be done, as I'm sure none of us will be surprised. Look, Yvonne, I can I can only tell you what I enjoy. I like I like it that way. That's the way to go for me. But there are people that will disagree. And there are also people that will get very angry if you put if you then put your knife, your creamy knife in your jammy pot. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded dirty. <laughs> there are people that will get very upset. If you cross pollinate, I'm like, it's all going in my mouth. It's f oh lord, <laughs> um, it's all going in my tummy, so it's fine. Um, yes. Exactly. How are you going to spread the cream on top of the jam? That's that's my question too. That's my question too. <laughs> um we are talking about um hang on that's sorry cream then yes exactly well i don't mind cross contamination i don't mind it <laughs> um what was that pretty pick are we talking about buttercream or cream cheese none of those things we're talking about clotted cream Cl clotted cream cornish or devonian clotted cream it's like it's like a butter, but it's got a crust on the top. I I I don't I don't even know. It's not like a buttercream. It's it's thicker and more viscous than a. It's more gluey than a buttercream, um, and it's also, I suppose, in texture, it's kind of more like cream cheese, but at the same time, it's denser. It's delightful though. Wait, you call it whipped cream? Whipped cream's the stuff that comes out of the choo choo choo, the f the bottle. That's whipped cream. We have that. Or you can mix it if you have time on your hands. <laughs> but look, Scarlett, here's the deal. Let's just remember that the heavier you are, the harder you are to kidnap. So eat that scone, eat that clotted cream, 
because they can't pick you up. You are kidnap proof. That's how you do it. Eat the pie. Stay safe. Closet cream is, is you can make it. I don't know how. I don't cook. Um, but you can also buy it in delightful little pots. It's 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 the best thing. It's I don't know why I don't have scones more regularly. I do. I would not. They'd have to cut me out of my house. <laughs> but love it. Then I prescribe 65 scones with clotted cream for you. <laughs> that is that is that is what you need. <laughs> not medical advice, not that kind of doctor. <laughs> don't listen to me. I don't know anything. Um check out the this ProPublica article as as per it's the research on this. I I mean, I haven't read all of their stuff, but the stuff they have done, I've put it done stuff on read their stuff on repatriation and the stuff they have done on repatriation has just always been so phenomenally well researched um just really in depth very long articles which is one of the reasons why i always just say go and read it but uh some of the things that i want to pick out this is about this new law in illinois to shift repatriation and reburial power to tribal nations so some of the experts explanation of i love the way they've explained it so i've just pulled out some paragraphs explaining what this law is and I'm sure there's more to it than that. Uh, the law makes it the state's responsibility to help return ancestral remains, funerary objects and other important cultural items to tribal nations. It compels the state to follow the lead of tribal nations throughout the repatriation process. It also establishes a state repatriation and reinterment fund to help with the costs of rebur reburial. Tribal consultation and the repair of any damage to burial sites, remains or sacred items. The new law increases criminal penalties for the looting and desecration of grave sites while adding a ban on profiteering from human remains and funerary objects through their sale, purchase or exhibition. Thank you. Yes, that is what should be happening for not, not just ancestral remains, everybody's remains. You shouldn't be able to profit from selling them. It also mandates that tribal nations should be consulted as soon as possible when indigenous grave sites are unintentionally disturbed or unearthed, such as during construction projects. They should be first on your speed dial. Yes. The law empowers the IDNR to set aside and maintain land solely for the reburial of repatriated Native American ancestors and their belongings, because it's been pointed out there's a lack of protected places for reburial in Illinois. So, these items, these remains get handed back and then what? They're placed somewhere that then gets dug up again. We're told that this law is part of a broader effort to recenter nature vo native voices in Illinois and within state institutions, a commitment brought to the Illinois State Museum in part by its former director, Cinnamon Caitlin Legutu, before her death this year. It was signed in tandem with two others' laws. One requires the history of Native Americans in the Midwest to be taught in Illinois public schools, and another that bans school boards from prohibiting students from wearing cultural or tribal clothing and regalia in schools and at graduation ceremonies. And I can almost feel Ron DeSantis's um, skull brains and skull veins just popping as we speak. Fabulous. Yes. It, it's... Uh, it's it's a tale of two halves for the United States, isn't it? It's for those of you who are over there. Does does the Union feel in jeopardy because of these sort of the differences? I think that certainly with with um, governance in states has it, it, as an outsider looking in, it, it, it feels like incredibly it looks incredibly fractured um and i, I that I, that must I, that can only be very frightening um things feel very frightening here with the stuff that i'm seeing going on but um th that sort of that pulling apart is i i, I you have my sympathies and i can only imagine how frightening it must feel Thank <laughs> you. 
What I don't understand is a lot of what's going on, particularly with the, the dictats and dictums about what can be read and etc. That feels like tyranny. And isn't isn't that the sort isn't that the sort of the point of like what the NRA says about that particular amendment that I don't know how much I can say without getting, you know, in trouble on, on this. Um, isn't it supposed to be about defeating tyranny? You'd think it would stop people being tyrannical, but it seems like not so much. And it's weird because the people who support it the most are the tyrants. Isn't this just, it's baffling. It's baffling. Melissa, that's, yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I have no idea what the answer is, but the but thank you as well for the super chat. But I, I suppose that, fa that factionalism, and in fact, I've talked about it in, 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 my, in my video on Wolsey a little bit that I put out on Friday, that se allowing faction to foster, allowing these incredibly polarised groups to vie for supremacy and attention and all of the rest of it, having teams for people to pick, it doesn't serve the people. It serves the people who are sat at the top. And ultimately, um, there's a guy on TikTok who's a senator, and he says something quite interesting. He talked about how when there aren't cameras there, all of these sort of swivel-eyed, far-right individuals who are just in, in whichever house saying objectively objectionable stuff. I was about to swear then, and I didn't. I held it back. When there's no cameras present, they're not like that. So it is all for show. It is the 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 commerce of outrage. And with what Space Karen has done with X to um is it's and, and monetization, it's outrage farming. And that's gonna make things worse. I suppose the only thing we can do is is be as media and social media literate as possible and 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 refuse to get on a team because it doesn't serve any of us to get on a team. We can't hero worship our politicians because they're just people. Um, we're on to repatriations now, friends. Um, this... Bella Engelman, who was murdered during the Holocaust. The this is his book, and it has been found and returned to his family. So Bella or Bella uh, was sent to Auschwitz when he was thirteen, and there he was murdered. Some of his family did survive, including three sisters and a brother. They had nothing of him to prove that he had lived. But a childhood belonging was found in Hungary. It's a book of Exodus that had belonged to the boy Bela. His name was stamped inside and there was a book of scripture and in blue ink next to his neatly written signature. It was in the possession of a Hungarian antique book collector who bought, a book, who bought books from a store in Bonad and it contained this item. The collector's son was browsing through the books in June and he noticed the name Bela Engelman written in one book repeatedly and he recognised that name from a memoir about the Holocaust that he had recently read. This is so like the kismet of this. So the memoir is called Lily, Lily's Promise and it's written by a Holocaust survivor, the, the elder sister of Bela Engelman. Uh, it was written by her and her uh, great-grandson. The lady and her great-grandson, who do live in London, have also been on TikTok chronicling her experience of surviving the Holocaust. And 
talking about the rise of anti-Semitism around the world. This then, of course, allowed the individual who'd read the novel, The Collector's Son, to find them and make contact. They sent a He sent a picture of the book. They recognised it straight away. And then they show the great-grandmother. So she got it back. Which is just tragic, but lovely. And it makes me want to cry. Um, but yeah, so that is that is the news, our first piece of repatriation news. Um, do check out that article and also go and see their social media as well. We have got activists who are talking to the Rubin Museum who have funded a Nepalese institution. They are warning of it being a bid to divert attention from the stolen artefacts in their own collection. So demonstrators have been protesting the opening of this Rubin funded museum. Uh, activists are accusing the museum, the Rubin Museum of Art, of using a project in Nepal to, quote, divert attention from the possibly looted relics in its collection. The Rubin, a New York-based institution dedicated to the art of the Himalayas, provided principal funding for the recently opened Itahomba Museum in Kathmandu. This museum comprises the first public galleries for this location and also its collection of cultural artefacts. Quote, this support, quote, cannot be a way to generate misplaced goodwill nor to divert attention from the responsibility of foreign collectors and museums on the matter of stolen heritage items from the Kathmandu Valley and Nepal as a whole. So the next day, a group of activists gathered outside the museum to protest. They, there were slogans such as say no to cultural invasion, Reuben, stop your whitewashing, Reuben, we want our gods back. In a statement shared with Artnet News, we have, quote, we are sensitive to these issues raised by those who objected to the Rubin support of the Athumba Museum. Repatriation is a complex topic that is evolving in real time, and we welcome dialogue with all parties in Nepal in order to centre local perspectives and arrive at a full understanding of the issues at hand. goes on that uh, the team, quote, had the opportunity to discuss with the Nepal Heritage Recovery Campaign some of the new challenges and opportunities regarding art from Nepal. Swasti Kastata, a curator and scholar of Nepalese art at Lumbini Buddhist University, who spearheaded this new museum project, has commended the Rubin support, saying, quote, at least Rubin asked how they could help, and they were very respectful in their collaboration. Why always look at the negative side? This is a chance to come together and do things correctly. We should acknowledge this is a positive step in the right direction and we should commend them for trying. Valid, I suppose. The new exhibition, driven by the community, is an exciting new era for the collection and for global museology as it foregrounds living heritage. And look, um, do you know what? I'm never going to be a person that goes, can't you just look on the plus side? <laughs> When it comes to the question of repatriation, I, I, I am not going to say you just because they've done one good thing, it doesn't mean you can take your foot off of the accelerator when it comes to looking at what else is going on, because they are right. It, it can't be allowed to divert. And I'm also going to be very clear in saying that anybody who seeks to argue, well, we don't want to put institutions off of doing the right thing by criticising them for not going quickly enough, then they don't want to do the right thing. They want to be praised for doing what they've done and they want it to be enough. Because if you're really sorry, you stop doing the thing that's harmful. So let's just remember that. This, I, do you know what? This, I, so many times I see a thing and I, and I want to talk about it and I go, you're going to want to swear when this one happens. And this is one of the ones that makes me want to... It boils my urine, is what I'm going to say. Um, Aztec dancers accuse US agency of confiscating their traditional feathers. There's, there's, ain't no way that the individuals involved in that confiscation didn't know what that meant. Ain't no way. We are talking about more than 1,500 feathers 
which was seized when this group of dancers crossed the US-Mexico border. Uh, they are now seeking a million dollars in compensation per person. Yep, fine, do it. A group of indigenous Aztec dancers have filed a claim against a US federal agency, which uh, is US Customs and Border Protection. That's what it is. They seized the feathers. I'm... The, they seized the feathers that are typically worn for performances and for cultural and religious practices um, at the San Isidro port of entry in San Diego. Quote, some of the things the community enjoys are our feathers and traditional wear. It's a way for us to feel recognition that we're proud and that this is a land of immigrants, but they want to clip our wings. It is claimed that members of the group were treated like criminals in their encounter with officials. The... Uh, Marek's family and the dance group said in a claim that was filed against the US Department of the Interior that this was a violation of their constitutional right to practice religion. They are seeking $1 million in compensation per person for their feathers to be returned. So it's an LA group, LA based group of Aztec dancers, and it's made up principally of, of family members. But Marek had picked up her brother-in-law, who lives in Mexico, from the Tijuana airport and headed back to L.A. They were going to perform at the annual Mexican New Year celebration, where Aztec dancers from across the nation gather in San Jose, California. The family were given documents after the incident that stated the feathers were from, quote, parrots, pheasants, ducks, doves, macaws, ravens, turkeys, emus and hawks. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects wild birds and they're killing uh, by collectors and the commercial trade in their feathers. So a permit's got to be obtained to be in possession of, of the feathers with exemptions for Native Americans, according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. According to the agency, possessing the feathers violates laws that protect endangered birds. Marek told the LA Times that she was unaware of the provisions and believed that because the feathers were mostly from animals that were neither exotic nor endangered, they would be fine to cross legally. Quote, all we do is share our customs in an artistic and creative way. I'd love to demonstrate my culture and religion without being treated like a criminal. Some of the indigenous dancers live in Mexico, some in the US. Uh, the group's council says that he expects that he he expects to file the family to file a lawsuit and if the claim is denied uh they they expect to file a lawsuit if their claim is denied the department of the interiors uh, declined mbc's news request for a comment due to ongoing enforcement and litigative matter uh my husband has just texted me going did that federal agency pus pull a muscle with that reach i mean it's yeah quite quite unacceptable that's the uh, so unacceptable i hope they get i hope they get the full bag every single one we have a rare cloak of harakeke and kiwi feathers that's been sold at auction for more than $72,000 despite frustrations that it should have been gifted to a in museum this one's a funny one this is a this item is 160 years old it was estimated to be that it would sell for between 30 to 50 thousand dollars but it's obviously far exceeded that the museum in question the this is the auckland museum offered to accept the cloak as a gift and even offered to buy it from the owner that inherited it it's thought this was made in the mid 1800s by and it was handcrafted by a woman, but it's been in Sydney in Australia in one family for 160 years. The family worked with an auction house to get the cloak back into New Zealand. The um, seller was quoted anonymously as saying, "Quote: It's time and only proper that this Tangawaero is returned to its country of origin to take its place in Maori history." But there is apparently more to the story. Allegedly, a member of the family who owned, who had this item in Australia approached the museum in Auckland seeking an appraisal, asking how much this could be sold for. Um, so 
all the all the time there was an, there was an as, an aspiration to sell it was recommended by museum staff that this person contact the auction house for an appraisal as the museum could not offer one right um they were however concerned about the care of the cloak and made an offer themselves but it was too late they'd already signed a contract with the auction house that there, there needs to be some capacity to step in on that one the cultural significance and care of this item is of course a significant matter of concern the auction house's director of decorative arts said that the museum quote expressed some interest in buying the cloak but never made a formal offer therefore it was the vendor's decision to take it to auction this cloak is made from mucca fibers and also something called watu which is a single pair twining technique it was registered under the protected objects act in 1975 and it now has a y registration which protects it from being exported again so it can be sold within Aotearoa but only between registered collectors of these protected objects that were found before the April the 1st, 1976. So it may not leave the shores. I, I, I think that everybody messed up here. I think that expecting money for something that you know needs to be repatriated is that you've clearly inherited it's been in your family for 160 years is uh -uh to me um but on the flip side i don't know this person's circumstances i don't know the desperation that you would need to feel to be prepared to take financial recompense for it i think the museum messed up by saying by not having an appraiser in house i also one but then equally why should they say this is what it's worth you don't want it being sold so you want to set up those barriers and i was in the auction house er, er, screwed up because they they should have they should have rerouted put it that way a Mississippi man has pled guilty to taking artefacts from a protected national forest site. He admitted to using a tractor to unearth artefacts in protected sites in and around Wayne County. Amos Justin Burnham, 42, pled guilty on Thursday to one court count of unlawful excavation of an archaeological site. When archaeological sites are destroyed, we are told, by unlawful excavations and artefacts are stolen, we lose important clues about the past forever. Because if you don't know what particular strata it was found in, if it's not systematically and almost forensically removed, you lose its context. You lose, and often, the capacity to date it properly. This person faced up to two years in prison, a $20,000 fine, and also the cost of repair and restoration to the site he is due to be sentenced on october the 4th the government is also seeking the return of the artifacts that burnham removed as well as a, a forfeiture of a massey ferguson tractor with a rear box scraper i don't really know what that was it sounds it sounds big um i mean yeah you take the topsoil up with a digger and then you go in by hand like we've all seen time team we know that is not how you do it Italian police have uh, found artefacts, Tomboroli Raiders, which is a great name, I think, for people who do very evil things. Hundreds of priceless works returned from America. This happened last, the Friday before last. 266 antiquities from the US, including Etruscan vases, ancient Roman coins and mosaics worth tens of millions of euros or dollars, all looted and sold to the US museums and private collectors. These include artifacts recently seized from a storage unit in New York from that antiquities dealer, a name we've heard before, Robin Symes. This is in addition to a haul that arrived in Rome that included 65 objects from Houston's Manil collection. 
the art unit of Italy's Cabinieri paramilitary police said the owner of the Houston Museum spontaneously gave back the items. Italy has been on a decades-long campaign to hunt down antiquities that were loot looted by Tomboroli or Tomb Raiders. Tomboroli. It's great. It's like Tombola, but way worse. Uh, and then sold to private collectors. Some of the items were handed over to Italian authorities at the offices of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Bragg's office said they included an Apulian crater or vase dating from 335 BCE that was seized in July from a private collection. According to Bragg's office, we also saw two other Etruscan tile paintings. These were looted in the 1980s. They ended up with signs. Italian art police said that the value of all 266 pieces on the open market would come to tens of millions of euros. Symes's Italy-based lawyers did not immediately respond to an email late Friday seeking comment on the new returns. In May, before Italy reclaimed the initial trove of 750 objects, Symes lawyers said the return was the result of an agreement between the British dealer and the Italian culture ministry following quote, years of complex negotiations and legal proceedings. Lock him up. If he's out, lock him back up. If he's dead, lock his corpse up. Um, but don't put it on display because we still don't display the remains of the dead, even if they are art thieves. Under the agreement, hundreds of archaeological finds of great cultural value are assumed to have been illegally exported and they will all be returning to Italy where they're going to be destined for public use. The deal also allowed Symes to use proceeds from the sale to satisfy some creditors. So those are the repatriation news. Let's now move on to the new news. And this is some good news, the first one. Because will you look at his happy little face? <laughs> he is over the moon, bless him. A boy from Hemel Hempstead, which is of the keyhole of England, M25. Hemel Hempstead is like up the top. Um, he is 13 years old, bless him little Ben, um, and he has found a Megalodon's tooth in Walton on the Nays. Look at his smiling chops. This, he was on a summer holiday weekend break and the teenager's da dad said he was over the moon. We can see that. Uh, and the wildlife experts said the discovery is rare. Um, so they've been, they went out looking because this is, we are talking about the Jurassic Coast here. They were up at the crack of dawn on Sunday down to the beach and they found this giant tooth under the rocks. They took their find to Essex's Wildlife Trust Discovery Centre at Water on the, on the Nays, who confirmed that it was, in fact, a megalodon's tooth. Apparently, they go to Water on the Nays fossil hunting once a year and also to the Jurassic Coast. So different to Water on the Nays. My geography sucks. They also go to the Jurassic Coast which is Dorset, maybe Lyme Regis is there. Um, uh, this is So the Jurassic Coast is where uh, Mary Anning did her findings. So they also go there. So this is a kid who's a, he's a fossil hunter. It's thought this tooth, this tooth will have been from around 20 million to 3.6 million years old. And... The Natural History Museum was sent images of the tooth, said, quote, normally the teeth have been reworked from other deposits and rolled around, which means they lose the sharp triangular shape with serrated sides. This tooth has little corrosion and its crown is near pristine. Oh, also, my husband just said that Hemel Hempstead is home of that thing that I'm sure you've all seen on social media called the Magic Roundabout, which I've never been on because I like being alive. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, apparently, the Meg 2 is being released. If you like the Meg 1, maybe this is um, for you. Alternatively, find out more about Mary Anning. So this is almost, it almost looks like it may have been restored. It looks very similar to the fossils found in Java, which is regularly sold in UK fossil shops. We may, may we believe it may have been lost on the beach. So it might have been restored. Regardless, he is as happy as a clam or a megalodon's tooth. 
The Magic Roundabout is a kids' TV show. There is also The Magic Roundabout in Hemel Hempstead, which is a horror show. Google it. You're allowed to Google that. I don't know how it works. It's one roundabout with little tributary roundabouts around it like a necklace. It's like a roundabout with an, with its own pearl necklace of roundabouts. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. But it's not a good choice. Ah, Devi, thank you. The Jurassic Coast stretches from Exmouth in East Devon to Studland Bay in Dorset. <laughs> oh hang on are these different ones wait is this different to the one in swindon am i talking about the right one husband is this the right one is it the, is the magic roundabout in hemel the one with the pearl necklace i've not been on either so Page, I saw I saw your comment. Save it for Wednesday. <laughs> this is this is interesting. So this find, the evidence uh, assembled so far, has suggested that these what they have found is these small brained quote ape men may have been able to do remarkable things. They may have been able to envision, envisage an afterlife, believe that an afterlife occurs in some sort of underworld, conceive the idea of physically burying their dead. Oh, both are known as the magic roundabout, but Hemel's is cooler and not in Swindon, which my husband has got um, a poor view of Swindon, which is bold for someone that, Grew up in Stevenage. <laughs> I'm gonna just do some Stevenage slander. Just a bit of, a bit of Stevenage slander. Um, <laughs> so they may also have uh, given grave, conceive the idea of physically burying their dead in that underworld. Grave, conceive of, give grave goods to dead members of their community. Carry out potential rituals. Create rudimentary art around the entrance, and also plan some sort of relatively complex lighting system to penetrate this uh, underworld. This discovery has been met with excitement by some scientists, but with skepticism from others, because that is the way that academia works. There is always going to be skepticism, and that is how we figure out we separate the wheat from the chaff. Peer review is important. Quote, we know that what we're discovering to breaks totally new ground and is therefore likely to be controversial. That is why we're deploying every possible type of investigative technology to ensure the maximum amount of additional evidence can be found. Uh, scientific tests are already being carried out, but large numbers of other tests are now also being planned to confirm or amend initial conclusions. The most controversial act of the, uh, aspect of the species is the creature's brain size, barely bigger than that of a chimpanzee. So. A crucial part is going to be examination of the skull fragments that were found in this cave complex. They have found at least 30 individuals in this cave complex, and it's thought that dozens more will be discovered in coming months. Certainly, despite the small brain size, it appears that this creature had developed very human-like, well human-like frontal lobe. The precise area of the brain known to be involved with planning and language i did not say separate the weak i said separate the wheat from the chaff the wheat will wheaten the wheat <laughs> um certainly despite its small brain size this creature had a uh, very well developed human-like frontal lobes which is the precise area of the brain known to be involved with planning and language. To make the discovery less controversial, scientists will need to provide additional evidence that brain size is not necessarily crucial in terms of cognitive ability. And that will involve demolishing literally centuries of scientific belief. This investigation so far suggests that Homo and Lady corpses were deliberately brought into the cave system and deliberately buried there. The evidence gathered so far points to living members of that species being responsible for doing that. We will we will wait to see what um, 
is the additional investigation finds out. Uh, it's interesting. The proposition is fascinating. Let's see what the peer review comes out with. Let's see what happens when this is when this is published, when when all of the findings are released. It is being described as the big freeze that drove humans, early humans, out of Europe. A big freeze, previously unknown to science, drove early humans from Europe for 200,000 years, but they adapted and returned, new research showed. This is ocean sediments from 1.1 million years ago, showing that temperatures suddenly dropped more than five centigrade, scientists say. It was thought until recently that humans had existed continuously in Europe for 1.5 million years. Apparently, now this is being altered. A drop of this magnitude might not seem too severe by today's standards, where we've got access to heating, warm clothing and food. But of course, that's not the case back then. Early humans were not yet well adapted to cope with such extreme conditions. There is no direct evidence that they could even control fire at this time. Therefore, the extremely cold and dry conditions over Europe and the corresponding lack of food must have greatly challenged human survival. That's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, with a, a couple of weeks off mid July, August and September, occasionally when it gets so hot um, that we all think we're going to melt. That's what happens. The big freeze is over by the time the early hum humans walked in Happersburg. Um, but it was still colder, cooler than it is in that part of Europe today. Quote, it may have triggered evolutionary changes in humans, such as increased body fat, insulation or increased hair. That's that's what it is. That's why I'm like that. I evolved. <laughs> I evolved. My genetics evolved during the that great freeze. Uh, and so that is why I am part seal <laughs> in terms of the blubber content. Um, it may also have led to technological developments such as improved hunting or scavenging skills and ability to create more effective clothing and shelters. Europe was a laboratory for human adaptation. That's a really interesting sentence, isn't it? A more resilient species came back into Europe, either because they learned how to survive better, or it was a different species that had more sophisticated behaviours that enabled them to enact. Our own species, Homo sapien, is believed to have evolved in Africa about 400,000 years ago. We were established in Europe by 42,000 years ago, coexisting briefly with Neanderthals before they went extinct about 40,000 years ago. What? Is this, the, is this, some, is this, some, this is what you call roundabouts? A traffic... A traffic circle. A tra See, we have turning circles, so I think we couldn't have a traffic circle. A turning circle is a, is a, is different, though. A traffic circle. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's evolution in action, babe. That's what it is. British archaeologists are calling for the protection of remarkably preserved Iron Age mammoths. No, Ice Age, not Iron Age. That's a different thing. <laughs> Ice Age mammoths. My husband's just tweeted, texted me saying... You can have all the technology and evolution you like. It's still humans that came up with magic roundabouts and Florida's education policy. <laughs> he's not wrong. He's not He's not wrong. This is one of the United Kingdom's most important Paleolithic sites that we are told is at risk of plunder or destruction without better legal protection. This is in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire. Um...
What does Brook? Do you do you just not have roundabouts? Is that not is not is that not are they not popular in America? Okay. Um so they uh experts digging in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire uh found a group of Brooke, where are you? Are you based in the US? Are you so you call them roundabouts, Brooke. Are you based in the US? They are not popular. Ah. Ah. Interesting. Interesting. Grid system towns with traffic lights. Oh, this is because, of course, you, you, all, lots of your cities got to be built with roads in mind. Yeah. I mean, roundabouts are like the roundabouts are hard because you've got to be aggressive. Like you've got to be, and you at the same time, it's 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 the it's the perfect <laughs> roundabouts are basically the perfect British thing because it requires a queue and order. So we love that, but you also have to be aggressive. So it's it's the things that we love the most, like barely concealed rage <laughs> under a mask of politeness and queuing. That's. <laughs> That is the British way. <laughs> um, experts digging in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire have found an, a group of extraordinarily preserved Ice Age mammoths, including one infant and two young adults, along with tools used by Neanderthals who likely hunted members of the herd. This was first investigated by a company called Dig Ventures. This is a group of archaeologists who sometimes invite the public to participate in their excavations. Uh, they said, quote, exciting doesn't cover it. Other mammoths have been found in the UK, but not in this state of preservation. They are in near pristine condition. You can't take it in. Westcott Wilkins added, quote, archaeological sites from this period are rare and critical for understanding and in Neanderthal behaviour across Britain and Europe. Why did so many mammoths die here? Could Neanderthals have killed them? What can they tell us about life in Ice Age Britain? The range of evidence at this site gives a unique chance to address these questions. The There is now a formal request that archaeologists return their finds because there's no legislation in place to ensure further finds are excavated properly as the law stands, and so Hills Quarry Products can even sell the bones. Westcott Wilkins said, quote, we have five major universities as part of our research consortium because the site is so complex and difficult. That's the expertise you need in order to do any justice to this. So it needs some it needs some legal protection. Look at this. They have reconstructed a child's necklace from a grave that's 9,000 years old. This was found in the Middle East and it has been reconstructed. It was buried with an eight-year-old child in a Neolithic village of Baja in Jordan. And isn't it just the most lovely looking necklace? It's now on display at Jordan's Petra Museum. The reconstruction results exceed our expectations, we are told, as it revealed an imposing multi-row necklace of complex structure and an attractive design. This necklace is among the oldest and most impressive examples of Neolithic ornament, shedding a new light on burial practices of people with apparently high social status. The production of the necklace appears to have involved meticulous craftsmanship. I mean, obviously, isn't it wonderful? and also importation of exotic materials from other regions. So this is 
evidence for complex social dynamics among the people who once lived at this site, including artisans, traders and authorities who would have con commissioned an ornament like this. Quote, despite its, its location, invisible and hidden between the rocks, this village had access to marine mineral and amber sources, resulting in a diverse range of ornamental designs. The research said that the extraordinary objects was likely intended to be shown. Therefore, the child's death should be seen as a public event that might have gathered the people of Barsha. Families and friends and probably individuals from other villages, according to the study. We have got an ancient harrow, arrowhead made of meteorite that's been found in Switzerland that is mystifying archaeologists, we're being told. Look at it. It's Nick cool. The team has determined this arrowhead was made of an iron, nickel and aluminium alloy. They found this out using an electronic microscope, images, x-rays and high energy radiation analysis. A bracelet and axe head from Poland are the only two known archaeological artefacts in Central and Western Europe made from meteorite material. The Twanberg iron meteorite is the largest found one to have known to have reached Switzerland. It's split into three fragments that may have been discovered in prehistoric times and used by those at Morrigan to construct this arrowhead. Chemical evidence suggests that the Twanberg meteorite was not used to make this particular arrowhead, however. So having ruled out the Twanberg meteorite, the team widened their search. Observing that the nickel and germanium concentrations in this arrowhead share similarities with the Estonian Karlajav meteorite, which fell roughly 3,500 years ago during the Bronze Age. Even though Estonia is near the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe, researchers believe the arrowhead is more likely connected to this meteorite based on its similar properties. Though the team is searching for more artefacts of the same origin to further their study, this meteorite arrowhead could point to a larger network linking Switzerland and Estonia for the trade of such commodities as amber, silic stones and iron meteorites. I mean, I I think it's interesting as well that this this arrowhead i mean i i want to are there are questions that i want to ask questions i want to ask is was this arrowhead designed for ornamental purposes or for use because the very principle of bows and arrows is that you release the thing it's not like you're making a sword blade out of it that you're you know intended to keep hold of so making something out of a meteorite if you make an arrowhead after a meteorite that you intend to loose then does that mean that you don't really value the meteorite in which case why are you using it is it just available i mean is it easier to work what's going on there or is this i mean it doesn't look like it's been used is that why it's it survived so why why then make it out of the meteorite is it supposed to be ornamental or perhaps merch coming very soon don't worry don't you worry um i i'm just wondering why an arrowhead is made of something that's that's clearly a fairly rare material unless it's not being recognized at the time as being a rare material those are the questions that i have an ancient coin collection dating from around 400 bce has been stolen from a South Australian farmhouse. We're talking here about Alan Lowe's coin collection. It contains some very rare items dating back centuries. It, the thieves would have had to lift a heavy safe to get away with the haul. And an expert says these coins will be difficult to sell on in Australia. The farmer, the person living at the farm, had the coins for forty-three years and had carefully locked them away, locked them away in the safe. But the thieves took the whole safe and its key that were kept in a separate cupboard. Wait, what? Okay, so you found the key, but you still stole the whole safe. 
So apparently the, the safe would take four people to lift. They got it outside and into the back of a ute utility vehicle or something. Weird. Including the collection were ancient Pantheon coins, Byzantine coins, Russian wire coins, uh, Indian, Middle East and African kissy pennies, as well as Australian and New Zealand pennies brought from various coin dealers. Some of his coins were extremely extremely rare the islamic glass coins wow have could have arabic inscriptions and uh, he had a few blue and yellow ones from the fatimid dynasty which was part of egypt from the 11th century um he asked a dealer how rare they were and was told well most dealers have seen a 1930s penny but they haven't seen a glass coin so pretty rare The police superintendent did not know if it was a targeted theft. Feels like a targeted theft. Um, my husband has said it's an inside job, I allegedly. Um, we're told the rural property is somewhat out of the way, so we're not sure if someone has knowledge or whether it should be a stroke of luck on the part of the people who've engaged in this crime. I think getting four people to take a safe out of somewhere, but also take the key, that's more than luck. That's that's targeted at the very least. Um we are told that the coins are going to be difficult to sell. So, basically, I don't think you'd be able to sell these coins online. They're so distinctive. It's going to be obvious where they come from. The coin dealing community in Australia is so small that pretty much every coin dealer in Australia will know about this within 48 hours because the coins are very distinctive. So I, when this is, if there's any updates on this, it's weird though, right? It's, I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be targeted, I reckon. We have evidence that ancient Greece had thriving pop culture. We have got a poem inscribed on a cameo on a medallion of glass paint. This has been found by a British archaeologist at Cambridge University. Professor Tim Whitmarsh studied a little known text written in ancient Greek showing that stressed poetry, the ancestor of all modern poetry and song, was in use in the 2nd century CE. This poem that we can see here reads, They say what they like, let them say it, I don't care, go on, love me, it does you good. Sounds like the Beatles to me. Professor Whitmarsh told the Cambridge University magazine, quote, you don't need specialist poets to create this kind of musicalised language. And the diction is very simple. So this is clearly a democratising form of literature. We're getting an exciting glimpse into a form of oral pop culture that lay under the surface of classical culture. The poem, unparalleled so far in the classical world, consists of lines of four syllables with a strong accent on the first and weaker on the third. This allows it, we're told, to slot into the rhythms of numerous pop and rock songs, such as Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. So there you go. That's sing it like that in your head. I'm not going to because I haven't got that kind of talent. Uh, Whitmarsh says, quote, we've known for a long time that there was popular poetry in ancient Greek, but a lot of what survives takes a similar form to traditional high poetics. This poem, on the other hand, points to a distinct and thriving culture, primarily oral, which fortunately for us is, uh, in this case, also found its way onto a number of gemstones. Isn't that cool? Um, Whitmarsh believes that these written accessories were mostly bought by people from the middle rank of Roman society. He argues that the distribution of the gemstones from Spain to Mesopotamia sheds new light on an emerging culture of mass individualism, characteristic of our own late capitalist com consumer age. How interesting is that? A 2,500-year-old marble disc designed to protect ancient ships and ward off the evil eye has been found near Palmachim Beach. It's been turned over to the Israeli Antiqu Israel Antiquities Authority. And it was announced on social media that this it was, so it's found by a lifeguard. 
and it dates back to the 5th to 4th centuries BCE. The uh, director of the Marine Archaeology Unit at the IAA explained, quote, from drawings on pottery, mosaic and ancient coins, as well as from historical sources from the 5th century BCE, we learned this design was common on ship's bowls and served to protect against the evil eye and envy. Aid navigation acts as a pair of eyes looking ahead and a warning of danger. The decoration is still common today on modern ships in Portugal, Malta, Greece and the Far East. So what we have here is a large white disc, 20 centimetres in diameter, flat on one side, curved on the other. It's got a central cavity where traces of paint appear as two circles around the centre. So discs such as this adorn the bows of ancient warships and merchants' vessels. Lead or bronze nails attach the centre of the disc to the ship's hull. Archaeologists have turned up a wealth of artefacts in the same area. Water surveys conducted by the Marine Archaeology Unit of the IAA since the 1980s, have um, found shipwreck ships testifying to extensive commercial activity in the site. Um, they have been discovered. Because this looks almost identical to discuses that I had at school. It's, 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 it, we had, like, I think vulcanized rubber ones I thought they were blimmin hard but yeah it looks it looks exactly the same i suppose without the paint um it's it it would look very similar exactly yes to ward off the evil eye but also as they said in this to help to strive forward in the sea to act as an extra pair of eyes Disguy, <laughs> discuses, discu, ragu, you pick. Uh, another one. Connected, but I believe different site. Again, don't quote my geography, but it's not got the same name. A student spots a half buried object, uncovers ancient magical mirror in Israel. You look in the mirror to check if something's rot, sucking your teeth, um, but some mirrors are more special, magical even. A 17-year-old high school student from northern Israel was at an archaeological excavation in Usha when, with the, IA, uh, the IAA said on August the 3rd. She was there with 500 other students and was participating in a, quote, survival course, a 56-mile trek between two mountains. <sighs> This we need to be if if you are not afraid of Generation Alpha, they are survival walking 56 miles between two mountains. They are going to be the generation that can actually legitimately say, when I was your age, <laughs> I walked 56 miles in the heat with no shoes. We're making them. We're making them. Um Near one of the site's buildings, she spotted an unusual object half buried in the ground. She uncovered this pottery fragment and took it to archaeologists. It was immediately recognised as a magical mirror. It's a greyish fragment, a half circle, indented in the centre and with a decorated outer ring. There are several arrow-like shapes pointing in the same direction. It's a glass mirror for protection against the evil eye placed in the middle of the plaque. So, two news items, both about evil eyes being found, all connected to or um, recognised by the IAA. Isn't that interesting? Yes, the evil eye is, is, is I mean, I remember being uh, in Istanbul and seeing evil eye everywhere. My... Um, friends that I grew up with at school who were Greek Orthodox, they had evil eyes on bracelets and necklaces. I had Turkish friends who had evil eyes. It's that kind of part of the Mediterranean and around um, North Africa. All, all they, it's, it's in some way, shape. They look different, but it's a very similar thing that's going on. And I'm sure that in, in one way, shape, or form, it also spreads out further than that too.
yeah, that's the. They they definitely seem to be to be taking those kids on a lot of really interesting walks. It's blinking up there, though, isn't it? I mean, also good on those kids for not being like, I'm not going today. I've got a cramp. I'm on my period, <laughs> which is exactly how I used to get out of cross country running. <laughs> A 2,200-year-old statue of Alexander the Great has been discovered in Alexandria. The Ministry of Antiquities in Cairo has discovered this um, statue of Alexander the Great within the ancient, quote, residential and commercial zone. There's going to be a run on evil eyes now. <laughs> That's going to happen. That's going to happen. I also play the clarinet and the French horn. They still tried to make me do cross country. But considering I started smoking cigarettes at 13... <laughs> <laughs> they, sw they swiftly realised that I was going to walk because if I didn't, I would vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't smoke now and don't smoke kids. It's bad choices, bad choices. So, um, as this area of Alexandria was discovered quote the mission found a large network of tunnel tanks painted in pink for storing rain flood and groundwater to be used during the draft time when they then they further explored the layout of the town it was composed of the main street and several branch roads all connected with a sanitation network um it's thought that this area was active between the second century bce to the fourth century ce uh, Waziri, also known for the team, found an array of pottery pots, coins, plates, fishing tools, and rest houses for travellers. The ruins of the area's building, combined with artefacts found there, have led the team to believe the town had a lively market, sold pots, and had workshops for the construction of statues, amulets, and other items. So that's cool. Talking about evil eyes, or at least things to risk not looking at, a winged Medusa has been discovered in Roman era mosaic in Spain. This is a 1800 year old Medusa mosaic, and it is beautiful. And look at the look at the preservation and quality. This is found in a lavish house from the Roman era. It's found at the Herta de Otero archaeological site in western Spain. Medusa sits at the, the centre of a patterned octagon meant to represent the Aegeus of Athena, a shield or skin that held Medusa's severed head after the Greek hero Perseus beheaded the Gorgon. In the mosaic, Medusa is surrounded by masks, geometric patterns and wildlife, including fish and four colourful peacocks that represent the four seasons. This thick-browed depiction of Medusa would have served Served as an apotropaic or means to repel evil. What is happening? What is happening? Um, wow, okay, so it's a means to repel evil. It's a 323 square foot or 30 square meter mosaic was found by students when they were excavating there in 2019. It led to the discovery of the mosaic this summer. It's likely that this mosaic decorated one of the dorm, the domus, the house's main rooms, such as the triclinium or dining room. The site quote, is of an exceptional nature due to the level of conservation of the remains and above all due to the ornamental apparatus that decorates the well-preserved house, not only the mosaic of the Medusa, but also paintings and sculptural motifs. Excavations at the site are still ongoing.
so my husband just said when no touchy touch becomes no looky look exactly exactly it's all linked it's it's as they were coming in I'm, I'm looking at the kind of the way in which they sort of connect i'm going this is this is odd <laughs> it's lots of stuff about seeing off evil etc etc we've got uh an assassination coin <laughs> An Ides of March dagger coin minted by Brutus after the murder of Julius Caesar is going to auction. We can see the talus side of the silver coin, two daggers, a freedman's cap, and also uh, the Ides of March is there, popped there. Only about 100 of these coins survive today, and a rare silver specimen is going on auction this month. This was minted in 42 BCE. We know that Caesar became an extremely powerful politician in the Roman Republic and then in 44 BCE declared himself dictator in perpetuity. The His colleagues did not like that. <laughs> um, this denarius, the Idmar denarius, is a Roman coin that's worth about a day's pay. It was minted by Brutus during the Battle of Philippi or Philippi as a means of paying the soldiers. On the a head side, there is a bust of Brutus and the inscription Brut Imp, meaning Commander Brutus, in addition to the name of the man who minted the coins. Brutus here, we are told, seems to be claiming to have freed Rome from Caesar as king, but is also hypocritically, quote, promoting himself and his own image on the other side of the coin, using the same sort of self-fashioning as Caesar that would be autocrat. This... Oh, it skipped. Um, pardon me. There were more than 25 different reversed talus dies that were used to create the silver Edmar coin. And each die pair could mint roughly 10,000 to 20,000 coins. So hundreds of thousands were probably made. This is up expected to fetch $300,000 at auction. Rarer still is the gold. Old Edmar coin. Only three examples are known to exist in the world. One of these sold in October 2020 for $4.2 million, the most ever paid for an ancient coin. However, that coin was then returned to Greece in March 2023 after investigators found that it was looted, making the sale fraudulent. This particular coin that we're talking about here is due to be, it's going to be auctioned tomorrow, August the 15th. So we will presumably have an update on that fairly soon. We have got a rare Roman steel yard beam found at Mile Castle 46 on Hadrian's Wall. This is a small fortlet north of the of Magna, the Cavoran Roman fort on Hadrian's Wall. It's in Northumberland, modern day Northumberland. The there have been recent excavations at Mile Castle 46, part of a five year project by the Vindolanda Trust to study Magna and the surrounding landscape. It's been supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and given a grant of £1.625 million. Top layers at the Mile Castle have revealed a rare steel yard beam made from copper alloys dating from the Roman period. It measures 22 centimetres and has a decorative integral central, central fulcrum hole to accommodate a suspension train. On the end of the beam, it's finished with a typical triple bevel design and a suspension hole from which a weighing pan was hung with chains, while on the other end were counterweights to be used to, as an official balance for weighing goods. A feature of this steel yard is that from the fulcrum to one end of the beam, are 11 evenly spaced, tiny circular silver inset points at 10 millimetres apart, used as markers for moving the measuring weights along the arm. Uh, according to researchers, quote, a portable steel yard of this size and calibre could have been used by a proficient Roman tax official, or trader or merchant for weighing small high value items passing through the mile castle or magna. Trading posts like this would have worked both ways, taxing goods entering and leaving the borders of the empire. The Roman army and emperor taking their own cut from this potentially lucrative trade. 
During the later Roman period, significant trade occurred as cut silver and glass artefacts were sent northward out of the empire to gain the loyalty of northern tribes. This practice might have unintentionally contributed to an increase in raids from beyond the frontier into the province of Britannia. Three ancient coins that were part of a hoard found in the UK were mysteriously swapped for with other more valuable coins. I don't know what that question means. How many Rome expressions are there? I'm going to need some more detail on that. I don't know what, I don't know what that means. Um, this was so this hoard was found in Cornwall and it's been tampered with. It was revealed earlier this month with three coins allegedly swapped with other more valuable coins. It's dis and a now disbanded treasure hunting group called the Mid Cornwall History Hunters discovered 56 coins in digs in the area between October 2017 and January 2020. 31 of them date to the reign of Nero. Under the country's Treasure Act, anything that could be classified treasure must be reported to authorities in the UK. Oh, I now I see what you mean. I, I, okay, Rome wasn't built in a day. When in Rome, all roads lead to Rome. The, the obvious three. Now I fully understand what that question meant apologies yes that did make that did make sense yeah i, I don't have any of others i want to investigate and see if i can find more hmm um so because this was Finds that this are property of the crown, except in Cornwall. So it goes to the Duchy of Cornwall. Prince William is current Duke of Cornwall. A coroner then determines whether this find constitutes treasure. If it might be treasure, then an inquest recommended or a type of judicial probe. So mid Cornwall history hunters detected the treasure with permission from the landowners and then reported the find to Anna Tyick, who is from the Royal Institution of Cornwall. The inquest for the trove was then held in Truro, Cornwall on July 17th. But the inquest was told that three of the coins from the original find in 2017 were missing and had not been reported as possible treasure. Instead, they were substituted for Roman silver coins from the same period that were similar in appearance but worth more. The substitute coins look similar to those found but are actually in a better condition and are more valuable than those they were swapped for. The substitution does not make sense. The exchange was discovered after a photo of the original batch of coins did not match the picture of those sent to the British Museum for historical analysis. The missing coins have not yet been found. The police interviewed some of the people involved. But as it was someone's word against another, it was difficult to lead to a conclusion. It's all quite suspect we couldn't take it any further. What? That's really weird. That's really weird. That's a good one. Fiddling while Rome burns. Yes. Do you think? Do you think that they were like, this? these are shinier? They're clearly rubbisher. I'll keep the dirty ones. <sighs> oh, you'd be livid. But you couldn't say anything because you'd robbed it. Oh, spicy. This is beautiful. So we have got a precious Roman gem found in a lagoon that represents a mystery mythological figure. This was found uh, just north of Venice. The 
Professor Carla Beltrame, who led the excavation alongside Dr. Elisa Costa, said in a statement that the find was rare, especially in an underwater environment. This isn't the first such discovery in the area, which suggests that it was a place that was used to be visited by wealthy Romans. In a lagoon environment, this is a rather rare find. To date, we have news of two other precious gems found in Torcello and Barrena de Vino. Um, the discovery, quote, the discovery of a of the precious agate gem is another piece that confirms the importance of continuing to finance research projects in order to outline an identity of the Cavalina Traporti area and community in the past. The collaboration with Professor Beltrame is also taking shape with the scientific dissemination of the underwater archaeological discoveries on the Northern Lagoon. As we know last, that we talked about um, in the last one, that they've also found the Roman theatre belonging to Nero. So this theatre was, of course, a significant find, in seven, it, it, which was referenced in several ancient texts, but this is the first time that it's been uncovered. So... There we go. Isn't that beautiful? And I, hopefully more will be found like it. Roman holiday. Ah. 125 tombs have been discovered, including two rare sarcophaguses at a Roman era cemetery in Gaza. One of the sarcophagus, we are told, is decorated with images of grapes. Oh, oh uh, so the Rubicon thing is about uh, an invasion force, a military force. And essentially, I need to, I need to properly, this is not my period of history by any means, but it's about the... Uh, army crosses the rubicon and essentially when you cross the it, it's now taken to mean you when you cross the rubicon which this army did there is then no turning back yes and and it's now it's now so we cross the rubicon it means you step into something different and essentially there's pretty much no going back from here is what it's now taken to mean There we go. When he crossed the Rubicon, he knew he couldn't go back. Right. Um, so this has now been fully excavated and displayed at the Pasha's Palace Museum. Archaeologists are calling for more funding to preserve what they have found. So this is 125 tombs inside the cemeteries. Among them are two lead coffins. It's believe it's said that this that it's hope this site will become a tourist destination with a museum to display the findings. Uh, at least 25 engineers and technicians have been digging, clearing the dirt, preserving the skeletons, as well as piecing together clay jars found inside some of the graves. We are told this is unprecedented. The existence of this cemetery signifies stability and ongoing habitation. Gaza has been under an Israel-Egyptian economic blockade since 2007, uh, after Hamas, which opposes peace with Israel, came into power. This narrow coast territory densely packed 2.3 million Palestinian residents have endured several wars. Peace talks aimed at establishing a Palestinian state in the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem collapsed in 2014 and show no sign of revival. And, and things with conflict in the Middle East, we know we know that on that landmass, just like in Iraq and Afghanistan, we, we know very clearly that those are places where the archaeology would be disciplined of well we have a fair idea that the archaeology will be disciplined defining so we need peace for many reasons 
but it's to save the archaeology is um is is very important um but of course peace is human suffering <laughs> is is to me the most important thing We have got round the clock excavations at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or Holy Sepulchre uh, that is yielding historical treasures. This is continued work on a two year, $11 million cooperative rest restoration project that is revealing fascinating details from centuries of patchwork building at one of Christianity's holiest sites. Ex experts from Rome have wrapped up weeks of careful, careful archaeological work at one of the most sensitive parts in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is according to the Custodia Terere Sancte, which oversees Christian holy sites in Israel. Christian tradition holds that Jesus Christ was crucified by the Romans just outside the city's walls as they existed 2,000 years ago and was then buried in a cave tomb nearby. Archaeologists have been working around the clock for seven days and seven nights from June the 20th to 27th to excavate the area in front of the Edicule or Idacule. The compressed schedule was intended to minimise disruption to visitors as the excavation required it to close to the public. The Edicule, Edicule is built on the site of the cave where Jesus is believed to have been buried. The most recent excavation revealed information about the early Christian layout of the Edicule Idacule, um, parts of which date to the 4th century. Under one of the floor slabs, archaeologists discovered a coin hoard that included coins minted up to the time of the Roman Emperor Valens. They have also found a fragment of wall cladding or the exterior of the wall from the main edicule, covered with graffiti from the 18th century in various languages, including Greek, Latin and Armenian. The uh, earlier summer, they were working on the restoration of other parts of the basilica floor, associated with assisted by a conservation group from Turin, Italy, Turin, Italy, and the Franciscan Faculty of Biblical Sciences and Archaeology in Jerusalem. They uncovered an ancient drainage system and explored different masonry techniques and types of cement used. Interesting. Thank you for that. Archaeologists have discovered a 900 year old English cathedral's hidden medieval crypt. They also found the original foundation of Exeter Cathedral's high altar. They found Roman era structures and empty graves. So excavations at ex Exeter Cathedral in England have uncovered the original foundation of the 12th century high altar, a medieval crypt, and the empty tombs of two bishops, marking, quote, the most, most exciting archaeological discovery ever made at the site. They found it while excavating the cathedral's choir, and the dig took place ahead of the installation of a more environmentally friendly underfloor heating system, as well as significant conservation for the historic building. Previous finds made by the team include a street, wooden buildings and a townhouse. This most recent dig, they found, uh, quote, the buried floors of the Norman Cathedral last seen about 700 years ago with the high altar. Behind the altar's foundation, they found a sunken area that may have housed a subterranean crypt, contradicting the long-held belief that the cathedral didn't in originally include one. The crypt was filled in around 1300. 
But when digging through the, the backfill, they found two empty tombs, each lined with stone. And they think that this belongs to two bishops of Exeter, whose bodies were known to have been moved from their original tombs in 1320. This would be Robert Wailerast, who died around 1155, and William Brewer, who died in 1244. The remains are presumably moved again to a later unknown location. They say uh, the cathedral's director of development, quote, we have been overwhelmed by the level of support and affection for this unique Devon landmark. But of course, we still have a way to go to reach our goal of ensuring a truly sustainable future for Exeter Cathedral for generations to come. A failed Mongol fleet may actually land in Japan after 800 years, we are getting reports. A recent shipwreck found off the coast of Japan this year has been identified as part of a Mongol fleet that sailed to Japan in the later part of the 13th century. In 1274 and 1281, Kublai Khan, the then Mongol leader, dispatched two military expeditions to Japan. These are known in Japan as the, quote, Mongol invasions. The Mongol army sailed to Japan in 1281 with up to 4,000 ships and 140,000 soldiers, making it the largest sea invasion force assembled until Operation Overlord 670 years later. That is, that is intense. When the weather turned against them, it said that a portion of the Second Armada sought, sought refuge in Imari Bay, hoping to ride out the storm, but instead they were met with disaster. Today, the area in Imari Bay where the artefacts from these ships are being uncovered has been designated as an underwater cultural historical site known as the Takashima Kozaki due to its proximity to Takashima, Taka Island. It's the first underwater area in Japan to receive this designation. Because, the underwater, visi of, because underwater visibility in the area surrounding the island is, quote, like diving into miso soup, so I'm assuming that means it's cloudy, um, not that the separated miso soup where it's quite clear on the top. I'm guessing they mean stirred up miso. Um, could be wrong. We take a close look at the seabed topography and stratum and narrow down our search to find ruins. I think we have almost established a way to find ships around Takashima. There are many ruins in Japanese water that remain undiscovered. Researchers also express a desire to raise one of the ships at a later time. Despite the technical and financial challenges to making that happen, the Mongol fleet may actually land in Japan after 800 years. So if, the, if slash when there are updates on that, I will of course let you know. But as we have experienced from raising ships in the past and trying to put them on land after many, many centuries at sea, it's an expensive process to keep them preserved and in one piece. An ancient sabre has been found in Kyrgyzstan. This is gorgeous. It's a military sword with a long cutting edge and often a curved blade. Blades like this are, are used on horseback. It's these. So with swords, you have thrust weapons, you have cut weapons, and you have cut and thrust weapons. This is a cut weapon. This is something that you use on horseback um, or, or some other raised uh, platform of some sort where you're moving quickly. The find was made by three brothers, um, along with one other individual actively involved in archaeology. The brothers in question have, over the years, contributed around 250 historical artifacts to the museum fund. This sword was discovered on June the 4th, 2023. And it's a unique find, not just in Kyrgyzstan, but also in all of Central Asia due to its excellent craftsmanship and condition that demonstrates the skill of the blacksmith at that time. We have got the pommel, hilt, blade and guard. This is a 12th century style of sword and that's, it originates in the 12th century in Iran and it spreads to Morocco and Pakistan. It's a shamashir shape or a scimitar as it's 
sometimes called. And this is lightweight despite its large size. It's They are renowned for their sharpness and lethality. So there are things about meeting um, leaders, war, warlords, rulers, um, military commanders who who carry and wear a scimitar um, and putting the lightest of scarves just allowing it to fall from the sky and it lands on the blade and just severs it the kind of the sharpness is is um is world renowned these brothers also found a five centimeter drinking vessel for melting metal and a coin with arabic inscriptions on both sides these coins were used in Kurdistan in the 11th century while the Karakan, the Karakanid state developed. The tools used to melt metal and coins indicate there were workshops for minting coins in the area. It's hoped that more swords resembling this one may be discovered in the area in the future, as this discovery offers fresh opportunities for archaeological research. There are some incredible swords like this, scimitars like this, in the Hungarian Museum, and they have Quranic suras written on them as well. So um yeah fabulous the thing about the thing about um being warfare on horseback is that what you want and in fact i think generally with all swords is you want reach that's what you want but you don't want to compromise agility of the blade and speed of being able to use it. And so the longer your scimitar is, the further you can be from the person that you're trying to slice, and then, the, and then, so the less likely they are to be able to slice you back. So that is why it's important. Testing of Vlad the Impaler's letters suggests that he might have had a condition causing his tears to be mixed with blood, which sounds traumatising. So a team of chemical scientists from the University of Catania, Spring Style Tech Divine, Design Limited, Romania's National Archives and the Polectinico di Milano, Via Mancinelli, have found in evidence that Vlad the Impaler might have suffered from a variety of ailments, including one that could have made him cry tears mixed with blood. Count Vlad Dracula, also known as Vlad the Impaler and possibly inspiration for Dracula, was the ruler of Wallachia during the 15th century. He was a, known to be a fierce defender of his land. That is an understatement that it's been suggested that he may have been responsible for the death as, of as many as 80,000 Ottoman people who were impaled. Um, so they have, these, these documents have been analysed and they were first of all looking at what it would have been like where he touched the paper, how that would have, how his hand would have rested on the document. They then also looked they they traced their origins they kept to capture the material from the paper without causing damage they use a technique that involves applying and removing ethylene vinyl acetate then they can remove it and test it in mass spectro mass spectrometry they found residue containing more than 500 peptides which then average to 100 of human er origin they found evidence of ciliopathy ciliopathy a genetic disorder that compromises cell function and organs. They also found evidence of inflammatory disease, likely resulting in problems with the respiratory tract and skin. They found compounds that suggested the Count also suffered from hemolacria, a condition that causes blood to mix with the fluid in tear ducts, resulting in blood-tinged tears. <sighs> Blood tinged, so pinkish red. Dis disturbing, disturbing. Is he? 
I need to look into that. I don't know. I mean, I, what I know about Vlad the Impaler is that he did have a very... Um, there are real questions about his childhood uh, and and why that might have made him potentially quite disturbed and and vengeful and very vengeful. Maybe I'll do some work looking into him. The 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 stuff. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. The the court of Solomon the Great. There are I've I've st stuff that I've read and stuff that I've seen. Questions. Um, his treatment uh, and what may have happened to him as a young boy and what he may have been subjected to as a prisoner there. So there are there are questions as to maybe that inspired him to punish Ottoman forces by putting a big pole up their bum. So that has been a question. I do mean that, yes. These things are not mutually exclusive. On the Bose Lion side, interesting. I shall investigate. We have got a skeleton. I haven't. Um, a skeleton. <laughs> we have got a skeleton. That sounded very weird. A skeleton, possibly a 15th century countess, has been found near a Senate building in the Netherlands. Archaeologists were excavating the area and they found the skeleton. It had been lying in Hof Hofkapel, a formal chapel lo located in the Parliament building. Eight skeletons were found buried there in total. But one of particular interest uh, has been found, and it's of interest because it's thought it might have belonged to the 15th century countess known as ja Jacoba van Beeren. She was the Countess of Holland, Zealand and Haino in the Low Countries from 1417 to 1433. And she looks indomitable. I would not want to mess with her. Um, so an archaeologist working for the municipality of The Hague said that We've established that the builders following the dune relief when building the facade. This means they first stacked eight or nine rows of bricks and then built a few rows up to just below the ground level at the time. As a result, the masonry was not completely level because they had followed the dune. They then repaired it with a thin layer of stone and mortar. After that, it came up very nice and straight horizontally above the ground so they could continue bricklaying right up to the edge of the roof. I personally think it's a very nice new insight with regard to the construction of the Hopfkaffel. Archaeologists are now looking more closely at the findings to discover more concrete answers to their role in history. And it's, we are told it's going to take up to two years to discover whether the skeleton that they found is actually the Countess or not. Well, bless you for saying respected. I'm here. I'm talking about history. <laughs> and I did use the phrase, pull up the bar. <laughs> she has got criminal offensive side eye. She's got bombastic side eye. <laughs> and we are we are going to talk about um, vampires in a in a minute. Hold fast. There we go. <laughs> Not a minute, seconds. <laughs> that was a quick minute. Um, so we are seeing this report of a 17th century vampire child padlocked at the ankle in a Polish necropolis graveyard. Now, we've talked about vampire burials. Oh, and my husband just said that Charles is the 16th times removed great grandson of Vlad the Impaler. So there we go. Um, so I've talked about these reports of these burials before. And so do feel free to go and read this one. But what I'm just going to flag is that what are commonly referred to, I believe, in archaeology, archaeology circles as deviant burials, not because the individual within them is a deviant, but because they deviate from the expectation of a burial that, is appropriate to the customs of time and place. These burials for 
that seem to be about stopping revenants or some other or, or vampiric things, the individuals that are in those graves are people who, for some reason or another, were, we believe, feared in life. Perhaps they had some kind of physical or psychiatric or other uh, brain-related condition that made them behave abnormally. Perhaps they had epilepsy or, or schizophrenia or any other number of things that made them ostracised by their community, essentially monstered by their community. And in reporting burials like this, in this in this kind of oh vampire sort of way, we are uh, allowing those people, in this case a child, to be remonstered. Um, and so I'm uncomfortable with these headlines because it feels. I mean, obviously, the seventeenth the century child doesn't know, but this is pro almost certainly or very likely an individual who was let down by the human beings around them during their life, was then buried in a way that was deviant and in many ways a, a degradation of what would be expected and about beliefs about the afterlife and things could risk that. And now we are reporting this in the way we are reporting it. Um, so so that's that's where I sit on these on the articles like this, and I will I will I, that's what I'm probably always going to say. Um, so we're moving on to another seventeenth century story. The first English slave fort in Africa has been uncovered on Ghana's coast. Fort Courtmantai sat on the Atlantic coast just at the time when Europeans started shifting their interest from the trade in gold to the trade in humans, we're told. It was built by the English in 1631, and it's one of the earliest places where the journey of the trade in human beings began. It began life as a trading post for gold and, I and other items like ivory, and then the slave trade began from there in 1663, when King Charles II granted a charter to the Camp Company of Royal Adventurers of England trading into Africa, later the Royal African Company, and he then, the king, gave it monopoly rights over the trade in human beings. It served as a warehouse for the goods that were used to buy slaves. It was also a brief holding point for those who had been kidnapped in different parts of West Africa before being shipped to the Caribbean to work in plantations to develop the sugar economy. Professor de Course says, quote, we don't have that many details on exactly what these early outposts in the slave trade look like, which is one of the things that makes uncovering the foundations of Fort Courtmantine interesting. After capturing the fort, the Dutch built Fort Amsterdam on the same site, which is why its exact location could not be pinpointed, especially after it became a United Nations world recognised World Heritage Site, which made excavations dangerous and um, difficult rather, sorry. Um, archaeologists return there this year to begin further searches. So we can see that they've got the bowls of clay tobacco pipes there. The Nigerian graduate student Omokolade Omigbule, I apologise if I have pronounced that wrong, uncovered a stone that was identified as being part of a bigger structure. Quote, it was mind blowing seeing firsthand the remnants, the footprints of an actual building submersed and un subsumed under a new fort. Seeing the imprints of these external forces in Af Africa firsthand and being part of such a dig takes me back a few hundred years. It feels like I was there. Returning to the display of artifacts in neatly labelled Ziploc bags, the professor points out the rusty gum flint, which he said was in use in England in the early 17th century. The pipes with their small bowls for tobacco is very distinctive at the time also. Pre-empting the question about why the jawbone of a goat is important, Professor de Corsa suggests that it's proof of how the English occupants may have domesticated local animals as an alternative source of protein. Despite being on a coastline where there was fish in abundance, we are told archaeology is painstaking work. Um, each fragment of the past throws up needs to be interrogated and interpreted, but in some ways the hard work has only just begun. 
there's going archaeologists are going to spend the next three years trying to unravel the gamut of Fort Compmontine, its architecture, look and feel, which should in turn reveal its true significance. We have, this is a, I've called this a, a contemporary because it, the work is being done now. The trade in human beings, yes, but in terms of um, the the first, this is what's been discovered here is the first English slave fort in Africa. So the trade is happening, but it's about in the same way that Elizabeth, it, it, her privateers are shilly shallying around in Virginia, but there's not a settlement there till Jamestown. So. Um, the stuff is happening, but the foothold in the land in the terms of fortifications and encampments, colonies, plantations, whatever whatever term you want to use for it, that isn't happening. Thank you. I will look that up and I will definitely also be buying that book for my little boy. Thank you for the tip. The 1619 Project. Thank you. I'll, I will investigate. Um, the 10 Million Names Project, we are told, is aiming to recover the hidden history of enslaved African-Americans. Quote, for centuries, access to the black American story has been severely limited by a lack of genealogical records of enslaved African-Americans and their descendants. Now a team of dedicated researchers and genealogists is seeking to change that with 10 million names. This, we are told, is an ambitious new project aimed at recovering the names of approximately 10 million women, men and children of African descent who were enslaved in what became the United States. The, those 10 million people have approximately 44 million living descendants, according to Kendra Field, who is the initiative's chief historian. That's incredible. From the early, so before the mid 20th century, data about enslaved Africans and their descendants was really hard to locate. It was often obscured or erased or difficult to find. During that same period, descendants from, say, Mayflower had access to a whole different set of tools and documents. Quote, it's impossible to tell the story of the founding of this country, the US, without telling the story of our black brothers and sisters, specifically of our enslaved ancestors. These are our American ancestors. They helped build this country. These are my forefathers and everybody else's forefathers. This is Richard Cellini, who is the attorney and scholar behind this project. He added, this isn't about black history. It's not about white history. It's about our history. There is no us and them. This is about all of us. The, the project also including a, is including a call to action, inviting people to come forward and share their own family records that may amplify written and oral histories. The ultimate goal is to construct, construct a searchable database that, quote, corrals all of the information together. Quote, this is work that everybody can do and everybody should do. All Americans, black Americans and white Americans have parts of the puzzle in their pockets or in their homes or in their attics or in their closet closets. Bring those forth, whether they're old letters or diaries or plantation ledgers. Phil believes that something like 10 million names has been desperately needed for a long time. Quote, it's part of the solution. It's part of the way forward. It's part of not forgetting or erasing or destroying who we are. There is also a landmark study that's opening new possibilities for black Americans to trace their ancestry. We are told now researchers are taking a look at the Catuctin furnace using the DNA of forgotten enslaved and free workers there to tie them to people in the present. This is research published in the Journal of Science that's tapping into 
uh, biotech company, 23andMe's database of genetic information. We are told, quote, this work represents a step forward for enabling further study of the biogeographic origins and genetic le genetic legacy of historical African-American populations, particularly in cases where documentation is limited, as is common. This is That was Henry Lewis Gates, Jr., who is the director of the Hutchin Center for African and African-American Research at Harvard University. So what this is, the Katokin Furnace, is an unknown cemetery has been found there in 1979. It was found and excavated. Unmo the unmarked bodies were put in the care of the Smithsonian. Now, with the advanced methods of collecting DNA, 27 of those bodies have been connected to nearly 42,000 people from the present day who are related in some way to people buried there and to each other. It's hoped that further DNA analysis um, they have found that further DNA analysis, analysis was able to hone down the 42,000 people to a list of close relatives. These individuals could range from five to nine degrees of separation. So we're talking great nieces, grandchildren, etc. Um, the DNA also revealed clues about the people who were buried there. There are still mysteries about who may, who may be related to the people that have been, the remains that have been found. Um, quote, we don't have any idea who these people were because they're anonymous within the cemetery. Elizabeth Comer, who is the president of the Catechin Furnace Historical Society, she goes on, we have put together using our genealogical research and our historical documentary research, a list of 271 names of enslaved individuals who worked at the furnace. But we are unable at this point to connect those names to an individual in the cemetery. Douglas Owsley, who is the curator of the Division of Biological Anthropology at the Smithsonian, said, you can tie people to specific regions in Africa, such as Senegambia and West Central Africa, and then in Europe, some individuals have a considerable amount of European ancestry. Yes, because of the sex offending that was going on. Um, Coma says she hopes that the that close relatives of people buried there can be finally tracked down. She said, quote, our history has been obfuscated. It has been erased. It has been eliminated from our narrative. Our whole being is to reconnect with a descendant community, both collectively and directly. Coma says she hopes that the descendants can form a society, much like the descendants of the Mayflower have, to stay in touch and build community. And I, I, I hope that I hope that kind of work finds, gives people peace and finds and allows them to find peace. I have my concerns about genealogical and genetic research being done in a mail order system and i think we are starting to see some of the ramifications not necessarily about descendants from slavery i think this would i i, I can't necessarily see an issue with this some, with somebody psychologically um although i think that any genetic or dna analysis that potentially gives you either a distant ancestry or perhaps a most more a much closer ancestry that you won't weren't expecting can be concerning surprising and upsetting people who work in reunification of 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 lost families that involves psychiatrists social workers but with the ubiquity of things like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, people don't have to go through those channels. And in a way, that's brilliant. But in a way, there is no protection for people whom the things they find may be damaging or dangerous to them. So those are my... Those are my concerns about investigating or allowing a commercial entity to do this kind of work for you because they don't they're never going to care about the individuals are they they're going to care about the data and they're going to care about getting more people involved
They, yeah, and it's not their responsibility to know either. It's not. Um, and that, and I think that people, there is, I can see that there's a lot of excitement in genealogy and genetic analysis and the fact that it's become so available. There's loads of excitement about it. Um, but particularly for things as well, like finding out about illnesses, when you, when you go for like a BRCA test through the hospital, or when you go for, and you get a Tay-Sachs test, you have a genetic counselor, you have a therapist to help you with the stuff you're going to uncover. That's not, that's not happening in this. Yeah. It, it's this, it's, this is, it's the wild west. As with so much of the internet, this is the wild west. And there is harm being done. You only have to watch an episode of something like, something like Long Lost Family to see how high the stakes are. Um, and I, I have been, I have been approached in the past to um, promote these kinds of genealogy and and tracing things on my channel and I won't do it for that reason I have done a 23andMe I I got results that I was expecting I was pleased to do it it was interesting to me um but that is not the case for everybody and I I think it is I think that that it is being dealt with by these companies for profit carelessly I think it's I think it's careless Oh, that's fascinating, Brooke. You do this work. It's a responsibility to counsel people on the potential risks. It's our, it's part of our code of ethics. Exactly. But if you are just sending your spit in a tube in, there's no counselling, is there? There's no counselling. Sinkholes close to a Ballarat primary school are raising concerns about uh, about this historical gold mine. Oliver McDonald fell into a sinkhole 50 metres from his primary school in Ballarat last year. He was nine. He laughed it off, as nine-year-olds will do. But his dad, Sean, was not amused. So essentially we're told that the only thing that stopped him going fully down this sinkhole was his backpack. He would have been very badly hurt, it seems. Nine months later, apparently the hole had not been repaired. Its edges are crumbling, creating an even bigger ca uh, cavity. The local authority was, was contacted. They said they would organise something. An hour or two later, nothing had been done. So uh, now, apparently, the uh, contractors are going to undertake repairs to try and close this sinkhole. According to the information from Victoria's Department of Education, the sinkhole is adjacent to a nearby historic gold mine. Situated near the Black Hill Primary School, the gold mine was started in the 1860s by Crocodile Co. It's an open cut mine as seen on the interactive gold maps online. And it produced nearly 600 ounces of gold. Yes, Ballarat in Ballarat in Australia. Uh, in 2007, a, a Ballarat East man returned home from shopping one day to find his backyard had completely caved in due to an old mine shaft located on his property. Yikes. Um, Federation's University lecturer in applied geochemistry and economic geology, Hayden Swan, said historic mines could be difficult to deal with as the shafts were often small and hard to locate. All of the deeper mines, they've usually left voids at depth and put a cap over the surface. And if they were old enough, the cap would have been timber, which obviously would not last forever. Anywhere north 
of Bunningyong to Invermay, there's potentially lots of smaller ones. We've got no idea where they are. <sighs> so we've got potential sinkholes all over the place because of gold mining. That sounds uh, that sounds pretty scary to have your kids at a school where there could be a sinkhole opening up. Um, Mr McCarthy said that during his 40-year career, he would see one or two collapse shafts per year. It does depend on rainfall. If it's a wet year, then you tend to get more of them. And the liability really varies, but it's usually with the landowner. So if you've got a block of land and it's got a shaft, you've got to fix it yourself. So we will um, have to see what, um, what carries on there. Uh, what's going on? I'm just going to I'm going to put this. I don't I don't want to start um, limiting people from commenting. Um, but what I am going to say is that I think it's fairly well established that the chattel slavery of African individuals and its systemic use and continuation and the and the legacy it left is different from other forms of enslavement that happened before and since because it was supported because of beliefs shaped around race, because of dehumanization of other human beings. It was different um, and that had to happen because to biblically support something like being able to beat and even kill another human being you had to reduce them to being less than human other forms of slavery i'm not going to defend them but it is it is systematically and systemically different and its legacy um damage uh, and and difficulty that is caused that is still being felt by um the descendants of enslaved people and people who look like them is systemic of the issues that were started with chattel slavery and the systems put in place to support, condone and make out that it was okay. We have got uh, UNESCO recommending that Venice be put on its heritage in danger list. UNESCO has recommended that one of the most popular and fragile tourist destinations in Italy be added to its its heritage in danger list. Scarlett, there's there's I don't want any there's no need to apologise. Um, a conversation debate is totally fine. Um, what I am going to say is let's all let's all remember that this is a public forum uh, and that this chat is being is being held publicly and will be visible as well. And um, we can certainly have the debate. But I, I think that honestly, I think that any conversation where we get into a value judgment about which form of slavery was better or worse is always going to be a race to something unpleasant uh, and and disappointing for all concerned and also harmful to individuals who who for whom this may be a source of pain i think we can all agree that the enslavement of human beings then now going forward is disgusting and it's a crime against humanity that there doesn't there doesn't need to be a ranking of who did slavery worse. It's horrendous. In the same way, we don't need to rank genocides. One was not better than the other. They were they were all horrendous. 
So, um, what's going on with Venice? <laughs> what's happening with Venice? Shall we find out? Um, United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization is calling on the Italian government to, quote, ensure the utmost education to address, quote, the long-standing problems in Venice, which has been grappling for years with too many tourists and the effect of climate change. Venice is one of 1,157 uh, places currently designed designated a world heritage site which have outstanding universal value because of their cultural or natural offerings it's recommended that venice be put on the world heritage in danger list was made by unesco in its provisional agenda ahead of the 50 40 the blah, 45th session of the agency's world heritage committee which is to be scheduled to be held in riyadh in saudi arabia in september this is because there has, quote, not been a significant level of progress in addressing the persistent and complex issues related in particular to mass tourism, development projects and climate change. The draft resolution stated that these issues are causing, quote, deterioration and damage to building structures in urban areas, degrading the cultural and societal social identity of the property and threatening the integ integrity of its cultural environmental and landscape attributes and values there's a seesaw of weather related problems we're told so in february there was a drought so bad that it was impossible for gondolas water taxis and ambulances to get through some canals then in 20 november 29 in november 2019 the flooding was so bad that historical uh, treasures and buildings were endangered over tourism in Venice has been an ongoing issue, UNESCO noting that some of the efforts in place to combat that, such as a ban on large ships entering the San Marco Basin in the Guidecca, that's not how that's pronounced, canal, uh, still the report said the effect of the continuing deterioration due to human intervention, including continuing development, the impacts of climate change and mass tourism threaten to cause irreversible changes to the outstanding universal value of Venice. So we'll have to wait and see after this goes on what they're going to suggest. The municipality of Venice said it, quote, will carefully read the proposed decision published today by the Centre for UNESCO's World Heritage Committee and will exchange views with the government, which is the state party with which UNESCO interacts. CNN reached out to the Italian Culture Ministry, which said it has not released a statement on the recommendation. It, CNN also reached out to the Italian Tourism Ministry and the Municipality of Venice, but neither had responded by the time of publication. So I don't know what the answer is going to be. We will have to wait and see, I'm guessing. Human history in one click, a database with 2,400 prehistoric sites. Scientists from the Research Centre, which is this an acronym, ROKIA, I'm not sure how they're, how they're going to pronounce that, but it's the role of culture in early expansions of humans, have compiled information on 2,400 prehistoric sites and 24,000 assemblages from more than 100 ancient cultures. This digital data collection is available for free to scientists and amateurs, and it was recently published in the journal PLOS1. So that will all be linked. Um, this represents one of the largest digital collections of information about archaeology, anthropology, paleontology, and botany, based on 150 years of research. How fascinating is that? So there's a map showing the distribution of African, Asian, and European sites in our in road. Examples of different types of finds road contains are shown clockwise from lower left. Stone hand axe, grind, grinding stone covered in red ochre, a shell ornament, um, stone projectile point, a bovid skull, pollen grain, a human cranium. Oh, apologies, that's human remains, didn't see that. A uh, double bone point and a piece of orange ochre. This has been going since 2008. An international team of six scientists and dozen research assistants have compiled this data. Wowie wow. It's uh, an easy to use map interface showing distribution across the globe. 
It also allows users to graphically present the results as simple queries. This is fascinating. Scientists can use Road to formulate advanced queries. For example, a query can help establish the presence of different categories of stone tools across Africa or the distribution of specific animals like horse, rhinoceros or reindeer during periods when the glaciers advanced or retreated. Such queries provide researchers with large quantities of data, which they can then further study using various methods of visualisation and analysis. The collection of these this data has already shown that much of the scientific knowledge of our past comes from just a very few well-studied regions, such as southern and eastern Africa and Europe, as well as Central Asia, Central and East Asia. However, Oceania was not part of the study. The blank spots hint at the expectation of exciting future discoveries about our species past from the fields of archaeology and anthropology. So, let's, yeah, let's, the, the, the more this stuff happens, once, once a database like this exists, this is only going to grow. This is only going to grow. Like thinking about things like Ebo, early English books online, that that is that database is just constantly growing as stuff is getting digitized. This is this is gonna go quick, I think. And we are on to our dingalings. And they and they're all there's no there's no wee wee winkies in this one. Um Digital archivists, pretty pick. I, I couldn't, I could not, for a fine fact, have done my PhD without digital archivists. It is literally the only way it happened. I did a corpus linguistic analysis of the Ebo canon. So pretty pick knows what those words mean. Um, essentially, I was looking at how wor which words pop up in which years. And from that, I was able to hang the argument of my thesis that around moments of crisis, you see in published material, in printed text, you see spikes that correlate with moments of anxiety and crisis. So, pretty pick. Thank you so much. You are, you and your colleagues are part of the reason why I have a PhD. So. We have, though, in the in the not digital world, German tourists have been blamed for toppling a 150 year old statue. A group of tourists posing for pictures to post on social media have been accused of toppling the statue at a villa in northern Italy. Apparently, they, they two of the group climbed into a fountain to hug the work Domina by the artist Enrico Butti and another pushed it with a stick before the 1.7 meter statue crashed the ground. Um, Bruno Golferini, who's the manager of the villa, said he lodged a complaint with the local police against all 17 German tourists who were the group renting the villa. They have left Italy since the incident on Monday uh, was captured on surveillance cameras. The statue was 100, around 150 years old and valued at 200,000 euros. It's going to be hard to repair because of additional damage to the tiles in the fountain. Domina was, in a way, the woman who protected the villa. Sadly, these are ignorant people who do these kinds of things, the villa manager said. Um, so that has happened. But it's not the only ding dong. There's another one. An indigenous-led archaeology school has been disheartened after a dig site was vandalised twice in four days. Um, QUE is short for Quebec, right? So this is a dig, I, I believe, this is a dig in Quebec that they found, they returned and found damage and missing items, uh, which is at Lac Lamy known as Cabishinan in Algonquin. Indigenous artefacts are also missing. Screens used to sift through sand 
sand and dirt were torn open, dustpans tossed in the water, tables and tents gone, grid system used to keep track of where artefacts had been uncovered is without the nails used to fasten it down. Quote, we were trying to do something, we were trying to educate people and trying to recover our own artefacts after previous years of genocide. To come here and be able to occupy the land and pick up our own ancestral artefacts artifacts and then have someone come and destroy all the things we bought here and then also take the artifacts is very disheartening this is what a wicked thing to do what a wicked thing to do um they spent the weekend clearing up the damaged equipment and then on monday the site they found the site had been damaged had been vandalized again so this is obviously very upsetting for the community. I think for 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 everybody at large, this is what a horrible thing to do. Um, it's the largest complex of pre-European site that's currently known in the Ottawa River, River drainage basin. They have found uh, so far in the dig pottery, arrowheads, hand tools, and other evidence of indigenous activity. They're working to uncover more of these artifacts, but it's going to be compromised when their their tools are tampered with. The precautions are now being taken to protect the dig site including cancelling public digs on weekends for the rest of the month they've also re reported the incident and uh, then a report has also been found with the Gatineau police that that feels really targeted that's not just somebody making an accident that's not kids being who does that um but we're not done for ding dongs, because there's a third. A tourist has scarred the leading tower of Pisa by carving a heart and initials. So a 19 year old French woman has been reported. This French tourist was stopped by an employee uh, who caught the 19 year old in the act while carving her words on one of the columns of the seventh rings so using a, a snake bracelet as a tool to scratch the stone she was then reported to police and intercepted by two officers who and she was then accompanied to the police station she confessed to what she'd done saying she'd scratched a monument with a heart and her and her boyfriend's initials she was then photographed and reported charged with aggravated damage to the national historical and artistic heritage this crime can provide for up to a prison for one year and a fine of no less than 2065 euros so that is i mean stop stop doing graffiti <laughs> stop doing graffiti on really important old stuff leave it alone i mean just keep look with your eyes not with your hands so those are um those are the ding dongs let's move on to our last section the events and exhibitions a prayer book that belonged to catherine parr a prayer book sorry written by catherine parr is going on display in Faversham. So you can see here the uh, Fleur Museum, the Faversham map is there. And if you go there, I believe it's a free museum, you can see the prayer book written by Catherine Parr, published, a published, so she's a published author. She published two books, in fact. This is Prayers and Meditations. You can go and see it if you. Uh, can make your way to Faversham. This is the first book published in England by an English woman under her own name. So there we go. Check that out. If you are in there is that's Laurie. There are pl there is plenty of modern walls to graffiti, and you know what? There is some incredible, there is some incredible graffiti, and I think that there are some sites. For example, what you see in Berlin on the bits of the Berlin Wall that still still stand, the graffiti, the political, it's become part of the tapestry of the history. 
this is not somebody cut this is not a 19 year old with delusions of romance <laughs> carving hearts into the Union Tower of Pisa. Graffiti, I think, has its place in heritage sites when appropriately managed. So I think there's there's um yeah, graffiti has its place when when it's legal. I agree. And I think it even has a place in heritage sites when it has been um thought out appropriately. Well, Banksy has of course now become history. So we have if you're near the UCLA, then you may want to check out the weight of a patina of time. This looks really interesting. So this is running until October 29th. 2023. The Weight of a Patina of Time convenes a series of works by Gala Poras Kim. The, her, the research-based practice looks closely at the layered meaning of objects in the 21st century museum. She's exploring uncertain histories of ancient objects, reimagining their past while charting new possibilities for their present and future. This is sculpture, drawing, installation, objects from and projects based on the Fowler's collections. I think it sounds really interesting. It's addressing the challenges of maintaining knowledge over the centuries and in shifting institutional contexts. It's inter an intervention into systems of classification and knowledge production. I think this is really, really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get a chance to make it over, but do let me know if you do get a chance to go and see it. Let me know what you think and um, what it taught you. Now, the next two things and the last two things are some shameless self-promotion. I hope you will indulge me. First up, I have mentioned this previously, but I was on TV and this is I was on TV in a program a series called The Queens That Changed the World. I was in the first two episodes. They've both aired now. I believe the entire series of episodes is available on For On Demand. As you can see, the Channel 4 has also, um, Woodcut Media has also brokered with a bunch of other places across the world. However, if your country is not placed there, I'm just going to say that there is no way that I would ever suggest that you look into a VPN in order to watch this, because that would be in breach of international copyright. So definitely don't explore a VPN that can change your location if you wanted to watch this and couldn't get it where you are and it's not coming to where you are or whatever reason. And, then, you know, I would never point out that there are some browsers like for example the one that i use for our pinboards opera that has its own free vpn i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't point that out either but there you go um people have said some very nice things i'm i'm really proud of it i think it's it's you know when you're the episodes i was in were looking at elizabeth the first and queen anne the last Stuart monarch of this country and i I'm really proud of how they turned out. Does it talk about everything? No, it's very hard to talk about everything to do with these two these two women in an hour or 45 minutes. But I, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. And last, but by no means least, the artwork for the tour that I am going to be the tour historian, tour historian on with Philippa. Lacey Brawl of British History Tours. If you are a history after darker, then you of course know Philippa. She is our master and commander. She is the only grown up at the helm. <laughs> and Catherine and I just wade through things, <laughs> swearing and generally making fools of ourselves. Um, the booking hasn't opened yet. If you want to follow and know when booking for this there are limited spaces uh philippa tends to limit her tour groups because of she wants to give everyone a really first class experience she limits bookings to around about 20 people so if you are interested do sign up to philippa's substack you will see it there it's philippa b or one word dot substack dot com and that is essentially her mailing list so when the booking opens this will be there and you can look 
into it but just to sort of what your whistle so to speak also the art there which i think is really cool is by Catherine holman she does philippa's art for her tours it goes on the tote bags etc so we are looking at things like i'm going to be giving some talks i'll be talking about straight shakespeare in stratford we're going to see a show at the rsc tbc because as for when this booking happens, it's for June next year. So far, the RSC hasn't released their theatre programme, but there will be a Shakespeare on, and I will do a talk on it as well. There's going to be a trip to Shakespeare's birthplace, to the schoolroom, to the Guildhall Chapel, to uh, Holy Trinity, and there's also going to to be another talk on the last day. It's just a weekend. So from Friday to Sunday, there'll be a talk on the last day where I talk about Shakespeare beyond Stratford. So Shakespeare uh, afterwards. And um, all of the all of the amounts and prices, because it's it's uh, so it's 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 June. It's June the 28th to June the 30th of next year. In terms of pricing, go and look it up because it there is a difference uh, as to whether, because the hotel room's included, there's differences in terms of whether you're booking as a couple or booking as a single person. Uh, the per person cost varies. And I don't want to say the wrong thing. So please go to Philippa her substack but also go to british history tours because it's not just shakespeare tours she does and she sells out fast her Anne Boleyn tours she's had another one because they sell out so quick uh, and on that on the Anne Boleyn tours you get to meet the fabulous gareth russell whose book i am currently reading he said he sent me a copy it's being released later this week on uh, hampton court palace and its history and it is a page turner it's fabulous as well so those that is the history news that i have got for you thank you so much i said i was going to do it less than three hours next time i'm going to be shorter i'm going to be quicker in my words thank you very much for taking this time with me um please do hit like please also make sure you subscribe to the channel hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will allegedly tell you when I've next uploaded and when I'm next going live. Also, please, in addition to commenting on the live, please do make sure that you comment in the comment section. And if you enjoyed yourself and you think you know other people who would like to be in my lives, do share this with them so they get a flavour of it. Also, please share news about the lives happening. I hope that you're going to have a great Monday, whatever point of Monday you are at for you. It's very late for me and I've got going to have my dindins. I also hope that you're going to have an absolutely fabulous week. I'm going to be back, not next Monday, but the Sunday after that, because I am off on a holiday for the last week of August. We're not going to have a Monday History After Dark. Nope. Different show. <laughs> We're not going to have a Monday History News. We're going to have a Sunday evening History News. But as you know, I will... Um, I'll probably do an extra post as we're not doing a Monday, we're doing a Sunday. But until we next meet again, and I hope to see you in my live chat for the premiere of the video on Friday, until we next meet again, I hope that you are going to have a wonderful week, that you will all take care of yourselves. Thank you ever so much once again for the great chat and for sticking with me. But until next time, bye-bye for now. <laughs>